Genevieve, our first presenter after lunch. If you could take your seats, please, and uh, get comfortable. Here is Genevieve. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, first off, I would like to thank the conference committee for having me at No Time to Wait this year and for putting together such a great program. I am grateful to have gotten to come and learn about everybody's work and to share a little bit about what is new at NYPL's, the New York Public Library's Audio and Moving Image Preservation Initiative. Um, one of my main roles at NYPL as the Media Preservation Coordinator is to support specification and workflow development for mass digitization of audiovisual media, which we've been doing since about 2016, um, working with multiple vendors in the US. And up until now, we've been working mainly with magnetic and optical media collections, but we finally began preparing for film, and we're about to send out our first batch of film this month, um, and we expect to eventually digitize the majority of our film holdings, which we estimate totals to about 20,000 elements. Um, in our lead up to film digitization last year, we carried out a small pilot project in which we sent out a set of similar film elements to three different vendors and gave them all the same specifications for deliverables. Um, we wanted to compare and contrast a few different spec options, uh, DPX, FFV1 MKV, ProRes, H.264, 10-bit versus 16-bit, 2K versus 4K, etc. Um, the long story short is that we were already leaning towards FFV1 MKV, and during the review process we realized that we were putting a lot of trust into our vendors to carry out the encoding perfectly, um, considering that we were not planning on receiving the DPX files as the deliverable. Uh, we love our vendors, but uh, with the high volume of files that we're expecting, we were concerned about putting all of our eggs in one basket, um, and especially that because digitization of film is so much more costly than uh, digitization of magnetic and optical media. Luckily though, Rock Cooked was on the horizon, and once it was released, we were able to talk more about our concerns and propose sponsoring some development on new features that would help us and our vendors more easily and quickly verify the reversibility of our rock hooked MKVs. Our team's internal campaign for sponsorship of open source software required a lot of serious advocacy and research, and I think that this is important to underline here, and it's something that people have said a lot um, these last past two days and at every no time to wait. Um, and that's just that if you're planning on using or if you're using open source software, it's really important to uh, be engaged in its in, in development, and if you're in a position or if you work for an organization that is in the position to contribute in a larger way, um, you can not only serve your own organization, but also the needs of others. Um, so that's what I think being part of this community is all about, uh, working together for the shared goal of preservation. And speaking of working together um, and sharing knowledge, um, I think it's also worth noting here that almost simultaneously, while we were trying to figure out how to sponsor these features. Kieran O'Leary um, shared some notes on his in-house verification process at IFI um, for addressing many of the same concerns that we had. So um, our situation was a little bit different than his, but um, this was just another confirmation that we weren't crazy for wanting some more quality assurance measures in place. So thank you, Kieran, um, and your blog is awesome. Um, so anyways, just to summarize, uh, these are the features that we sponsored at NYPL, um, the DPX impl implementation checker, the integrated lostnesses verification, and the addition of basic error correction mechanisms. Um, and I should reiterate that these things are not live, they're still works in progress, um, but we're really looking forward to integrating them into our workflow, and we're truly grateful to Media Area and to Jerome and Dave for all the work that they've put into fielding all of our weird questions. Um, and Jerome already outlined a lot of these features yesterday, so I'm not going to go into too much detail about them, um, but they'll essentially make the encoding process more trustworthy for us um, and provide us with a streamlined way to check reversibility, um, which is one of the most important parts of our overall quality control workflow going forward with film. So this is where we talk about learning opportunities. Um, we've gotten the chance to check some of these features out a bit, and our first round of tests we started to realize um, that we didn't quite know as much about DPX files as we thought we did, and, um, but we were learning a lot. So most notably, or perhaps uh, least notably, considering the conclusions that we drew at the end, uh, we ran into some non-conforming ditto key issues. 
um, these messages that were uh, coming up when we were working with some of our older DPX sequences and some of the pilot files that we got um, during the project earlier on. Um, so we learned that the SMPTE spec and FADGD recommendations are kind of vague when it comes to ditto key and its usage seems um, somewhat inconsistent, which explains um, why we had this sort of unknown value in some of our files. Um, but this is a pretty minor issue, um, and ultimately it was disregarded, but on the plus side, Ben made this amazing meme, and um, unknown key, ditto key values are allowed now, um, so it's all good. Um, but I'd really love to hear from anybody else who's dealt with this issue or encountered it or is in the process of uh, transcoding or rock cooking old DPX sequences. Um, I think it would be really interesting to learn about more. Um, so aside from that, um, things are looking pretty rosy for us in the film QC or and film digitization front. Um, when our vendors begin in earnest, we can simply request that they use these new um, raw cooked options, um, and those will initiate a set of cross-checking uh, and assurance procedures. And when we receive the deliverables, we'll do a reversibility check in addition to all of our current automated QC steps, which include checking metadata, fixity, signal levels, um, watching the mezzanine and access copies, um, and looking for other errors or bad captures. Um, so as far as challenges go, we're still figuring out how best to perform automated processes on uh, files that have different specifications due to the like wide variety of uh, film, physical film uh, elements that we're dealing with. Um, and since we haven't gotten a chance to test our workflow at scale yet, um, we'll probably also be dealing with time, time management and processing power. So those are just some issues that we'll, uh, we assume that we'll have to address uh, going forward. Um, but we are very excited to begin this project. And before I end, I just have to say thanks to everyone who helped with us and um, who has been involved in our specification development process, including our vendors um, and everybody that we've emailed. Um, our specifications are live on GitHub, so here's the link. And we always welcome feedback. Um, and thank you. And um, you can take questions now. Uh, we have a couple minutes for questions. So I'm wondering why DPX? What? Why DPX as a destination? I don't. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I, I mean, understand your question. Um, you're dis you're moving in the direction. Oh no no no! We're no. we're raw cooking our DPX. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I'm Stephen from the BFI. We're, we're rock cooking too. As we speak, we're rock cooking quite a lot of DPXs. And we found something that we, maybe we're the only people who allow it. So I just wanted to check. We, we, the tool has an expectation, or various tools have an expectation of continuous DPX numbers in mm -hmm. your sequence. However, we get suppliers who, who create retries and rescans and we choose to you know, allow breaks in the sequence mm. pragmatically, and we, we're cooking those, and we're working with Jerome to optimize the, op the options for that, but I just wondered, do you expect continuous sequence, and do you reject your DPX if it, if it has breaks? Yeah, part of our specifications um, requires that the sequence be continuous, but, you know, we haven't uh, embarked on the process yet, so it could be that we might encounter breaks in the sequence just due to necessities for working with different elements that need to be put together. Um, I don't know if that's something, like, that's part of your context, possibly. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I'll just add that to the list of things we'll have to deal with. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, so hi, this is Kate Murray um, from the Library of Congress, and I'll just a quick clarification about those FADGI guidelines. So they're um, guidelines about embedded metadata in DPX, so we wouldn't cover the ditto key, but um, I'm It's sure. in there, though. Well, it's in there, but we, yeah. we wouldn't, like, we, sure. we wouldn't say yeah, much yeah, about yeah. it, but um, I would say if, the, if there's some clarity that we can send back to SIMTI for their, because mm. they're redoing the 268, uh, ST268 for HDR, uh, DPX HDR, we could try, I mean, they, they may not be success, but, but we yeah. could try. That'd be great. I mean, I think that part of this is, um, 
part of learning about what we didn't know about TPX was like not even knowing how to ask the question. So like this has sort of like started that like what now we don't know like this is something that we didn't really know about like how do we even ask them to fix it if we don't know about it? So like I would love to hear more about even just like the language that people use to like I don't know to 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 formulate questions and like recommendations for additions to things like that. Anybody else? All right, thank you. Thank you, Genevieve. And we'll welcome our next presenters. Please welcome Annie and Ben. Someone help with presenter mode issues. Oh, sorry. Hi, live stream. <laughs> I don't do this oh. willfully. I don't care. Okay. I don't want to let out. How did that work? Oh. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right, opening, opening closed captions. Um, we, we will set the scene here with an email that went out to the EMEA listserv in 2007. Uh, does anyone have any suggested methods for decoding the closed caption information off of digitized video, preferably in a way that keeps the relationship between the captions and the time code? For those reading the who can't read the signature, this was written by David Rice, archivist at Democracy Now! Uh, Dave did not get a lot of responses to his email in 2007, but his question was a good one. Um, captions, just to start with a definition, are transcriptions of dialogue and other audio cues that are displayed over the image of an audiovisual program. Uh, captions are first and foremost a form of access for deaf people and others with hearing impairments. Um, captions were not part of the NTSC signal when it was standardized, so they had to be retroactively engineered into broadcast television. Um, these are the first American captions ever broadcast by WGBH in 1972 on an episode of The French Chef. These first captions were open, that is, they were burned into the image. Um, closed captions, which we'll be talking about, are not part of the image and can be turned on or off by the viewer. Today, extracting captions from the analog signal and turning them into digital text has a wide range of applications. Uh, accessibility is still primary. Extracted captions can be turned into streaming captions for the web, but extracted captions also let us do full text search of television programs or they can make cataloging easier or a wide range of other uses. Um, if we're able to extract captions, we can build upon decades of labor that often goes unnoticed because it's un invisible by default. So where will you find these captions? First off, you will need to have broadcast material or home media from North America, the caption standard we'll be talking about is called EIA or CEA 608. It's also known as Line 21, and it's supported in both analog NTSC and digital ATSC broadcast standards. So this presentation is going to be less relevant to collections with mostly European materials, for which I apologize, as we are currently in Europe, of course. Um, but if you do have American media in your collection, You'll start finding closed captions in broadcasts beginning in 1980, with some big jumps in the amount of closed captioning content after a series of legislation in the 90s. The Television Decoder Circuitry Act of 1990 required um, new televisions 13 inches or larger to have built-in uh, ability to decode captions, and the Telecommunications Act of 1996 mandated closed captioning for almost all English and Spanish television programming, at which point um, captions became the default for almost everything on television. Now we're also meeting requirements for closed caption on streaming media, um, but those are born digital. Um, just as an aside, also caption adoption did not happen on its own. Initially, captions could not be displayed on typical televisions without a separate caption decoder. Um, this is the 1980 series catalog, and you may not be able to read it, but um, a decoder here retails for $249.96, which 
in today's money is about $769. So this cost barrier meant that 10 years after closed captions were first broadcast, it was estimated that still only about 2% of deaf and hearing impaired people in the United States could access these captions. This low rate of accessibility was perceived as low demand by networks who then justified less captioning until it was mandated by legislation. I'm just saying all this to say, figuring out how to extract closed captions is not just saving us time and duplicated effort, but it's also honoring a sustained advocacy that gave us captions. People had to fight for closed captioning at every step of the way from foundational questions like how to add them to an already standardized broadcast signal to passing sweeping legislation in the 90s. So the difficult work, to, so to speak, of implementing captions has already been done. We just have to figure out how to extract them. But how do, how do we do that? Um, closed captions in the NTSC signal are transmitted as part of the vertical blanking interval. You can see them in the red line in the cyan portion of the image. Um, that is, they're contained within lines of video that you don't usually see on a television. So the vertical blanking interval was already used to transmit other metadata, such as time code, but engineers were able to find space on line 21 of each field right before the start of the visible image. Each frame of video has two fields, which means that two separate sets of captions are transmitted. For example, in the US, it's usually field one uh, stores English captions and field two Spanish. <coughs> Here is a GIF if you prefer seeing your caption data in action. We can actually see the caption data blinking at the very top of the frame on the left in a red circle um, right above the video image. You can also see this on a television if you adjust the vertical hold. It's right above the image. So each field of caption data can transmit two bytes at a time, and those are at the end of the blue arrows flashing by as individual byte pairs. Um, they're, hexa they're hexadecimal characters. Caption data can be extracted straight to a formatted text file. Um, SCC, one of the simplest digital caption for file formats, just records the raw caption hexadecimal alongside time codes. Other caption formats use a translation matrix to turn the hex into simple human readable captions, such as in the SRT and web VTT formats. Um, time text markup language is an example of a more heavily structured format used primarily in broadcast production environments. Um, each of these caption formats can be used for digital delivery. They are all compatible with each other, and many streaming services accept any of these caption formats, though SRT is, or, sorry, SCC is often the recommendation. There are a number of methods of extracting the caption data from the analog signal, but the one we will be focusing on today is FFmpeg's filter to extract EIA 608 or line 21 captions. This was authored by Paul B. Mahal in 2017. Um, it scans, this filter scans the field for EIA 608 data and associates it with time code, and I'm not qualified to talk about it much beyond that, um, but I am qualified to say thank you, Paul, for making this filter. Um, so now we know where to find the captions in the signal, we have an open source way to extract them, and we know what we want them to look like once they are extracted. So all it takes is a script. And this script is SCCU, which is now available on GitHub. It was written this year by Dave Rice using Paul Mahal's filter. It can locate closed caption data in your files and translate it into SCC and SRT captions. And to talk much more about it, the always delightful Ben Turkis. Thanks, Annie. Uh, thanks for that great overview of the history of closed captions, uh, for breaking down the different standards that are at play here, and for introducing the topic of how to handle and hopefully uh, how to extract and make accessible captions during or after the digitization process. For those of you who were here last year, or for those who watched on the live stream, hello out there. Uh, what I'll be speaking about over the next 10 minutes or so will be very much an extension of or possibly a corollary to the talk that I gave last year about time code and new open source methods that have been devised to aid in the capture and retention of this important but often overlooked part of the video signal. So yes, this will be a natural extension of themes brought up in conferences past in a number of ways. I'll be living in the vertical blanking interval. Woohoo, it's a great place to be. Come join me here. Uh, there's so much wonderful stuff there. Uh, I'll, be talking, I'll be telling a story of open source sponsorship in action 
And I'll be presenting a free and open solution that builds on FFmpeg and stands in opposition to expensive and proprietary alternatives. To be honest with you, in preparing for today, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to say. It's been, and I don't know how else to say it, a particularly messed up year in the United States. And sometimes it can be hard to maintain your enthusiasm for this niche work uh, when you see everything that's happening all around you. Um, but as burnt out and as exhausted as I was feeling last week, the prospect of being here with all of you um, and talking about this specific topic, accessibility, both accessibility for our collections and the accessibility of our tools, uh, it got me excited. It got me to a, a place where I was ready to talk about this long simmering but finely materialized new approach, which could not have happened without the hard work of people in this room who had the vision and foresight to see how generative the blending of the different communities gathered here today truly could be. I believe that we firmly entered the era in which the open source approach to AV archiving, and by this I mean the tools, the standardization work, and the overarching spirit and ethos, has reached or realized a kind of virtuous circle potential. There's a reinforcing quality to the advances that have been made over recent years, and there's a reinforcing quality to this community of people who are committed to helping one another, learning from one another, and breaking down the barriers, financial or structural or otherwise, that have allowed some collections to be well cared for while others are left ignored or maltreated. Closed captions are, in this way, perfectly illustrative or instructive. They are, at their core, an expression of a simple right of media participation that was long denied. Many of us, the archivists here, take closed captioning for granted. And in doing so, we potentially make more work for ourselves down the road. But even more troubling, we reinforce the kinds of exclusion and disregard that made this such a fraught battlefield to begin with. What I'm saying is that our failures in this realm are indicative of our failures as a whole when it comes to inclusion and inclusive thinking. We need to more actively seize upon areas of accessibility and insist upon their importance from the start, not as an afterthought. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, my collections predominantly do not contain videotapes from the world of broadcast, aka they don't include closed captions, and the ones that do aren't priorities for us as an institution, or if you're thinking, well, we're capturing the entirety of the video signal, vertical blanking interval and all, so this is a problem that can be dealt with at a future date, I guess I would argue that to me, this kind of thinking is in fact part of the problem, or if not the problem, emblematic of it. Now I recognize that we're talking about an absurdly small percentage of tapes, and I recognize that there's something absurd about raising such an Americentric topic at a European conference, but for me it's simply not enough to say, we've gotten this all figured out for ourselves. If you spent thousands on a proprietary solution, or if you're offloading this work onto a vendor, Congrats, I guess, uh, but that money could have gone to support and sponsor a sustainable solution available to us all. In closed captioning, uh, subtitling stenography and the digital convergence of text with television, Gregory Downey describes captions as suffering from a visibility paradox. And this, I think, is a useful formulation for us, one that can help inform what I consider to be the general or pervasive disregard for captions in our field. The very design of captioned text to be closed instead of open, Downey writes, to be ever present in the broadcast signal, but invisible on screen. This, he tells us, hides the very real human labor that was often performed by women that was at the core of this socio-technical system. While the focus of Downey's attention is certainly not the same as our own, we can easily trace the points of connection between this visibility, visibility paradox and our own lack of prioritization of closed captioning. Out of sight, out of mind, if you will. Uh, so let me now awkwardly attempt to get down from off of my high horse and tell you what exactly we've been up to over the past year. At the New York Public Library, we consider our use of open source tools as growing naturally out of who we are. For us, the ways of sharing knowledge and building community that are represented by the open source software movement uh, are tied directly to our wider efforts to promote and provide sustainable access to information. Uh, sorry. Over the past few years, we've sponsored a number of open source projects. We supported the addition of timecode to vRecord. We supported the addition of losslessness and integrity checking to raw cooked with Genevieve just described. And soon I hope to partner with the Smithsonian to see enhancements made to QC tools, which in many ways is the software that was at the start of it all for so many of us. And I could and have spoken at length about strategies for working within institutional contexts to advocate for open source projects, but I think the lesson in this particular sponsorship effort is leave no stone unturned. And how is this exactly? Because the money for SCCU came from what's called the Innovation Project, an internal grant program 
that NYPL offers to all of its staff members annually. And the grant provides an opportunity for people to dream up cool and forward-thinking projects, and the resulting efforts have always varied in really fun and diverse ways. So last year, for example, the Innovation Project sponsored a seed lending library, uh, a series of pop-ups and literacy events geared toward New York City public housing residents, and the 3D printing of some of the library's most prized treasures, things like E.E. E. Cummings' hand. It was creepy, actually, but... Um, there's a whole other story about navigating the bureaucratic waters, things like having to explain to stakeholders in IT, procurement, and legal that, no, we can't exactly claim copyright on an open source project that we're building upon. Uh, but I'd rather talk to you about the work that Dave did, the work that it leverages, and our experience in testing and deployment. So what is SCCU? Where can you find it? How can you use it? And how does it work? Uh, let's start with the easiest piece of this. As Annie mentioned, the project lives on the Association of Moving Image Archivists GitHub. Uh, once you get there, you can find our README, where we put usage instructions that we tried to make as user-friendly as possible. SCCU is a relatively simple, depending on one's perspective, bash script that automates the process of using FFmpeg, and specifically FFprobe and the read EIA 608 filter, to scan the topmost portion of the video signal for closed captions, and if present, then translate that information into SCC and optionally SRT files. Um, Annie described a little bit, but I guess the difference between the two, the main difference is that SCC represents the captions as hex, SRT gets translated in and more human readable. What's nice about SCCU is that maybe for better, maybe for worse, it removes some of the challenge of using the read EIA 608 filter, and it gives you just the goods. So in essence, it performs a series of tests and operations. First, it probes a portion of your video for the presence of captions, and it does this in a few different ways, as captions were rarely perfectly consistent. So here you can see one test uh, in which SCCU uses different common values uh, to detect closed caption sync code markers. Uh, if it finds captions on a particular line of video, it then processes that video through FFprobe and read EIA 608, and it takes the timestamps and the hex values that that filter provides, and then it structures them into SCC. If you run the script with the dash S option, the script will then uh, send the file that it just generated back through FFmpeg and ask it to translate the SCC into an SRT. Um, I guess somewhere within FFmpeg lives this uh, lookup table. I'd actually like Carl or someone to help explain this part to me, if possible. Um, so here you can see uh, a clip from Whoopi Goldberg's Jumpin' Jack Flash. Um, at the bottom here, we have the timestamp 9137, I learned, actually, is the hex representation of the musical note. And here you can see playback in FF Play uh, with the musical notes at the beginning and end of Jumpin' Jack, Flash, it's a guess, guess, guess. Um, for me, the extra special, uh, totally no big deal, but I love it so very much, bonus, that SCCU provides is code that you can use to preview your video with the captions overlaid in FF Play in two different ways a kind of standard playback with captions, boring, and a zoomed in, flipped, cropped, tiled scrolling view of the actual lines of video that contain the caption information with the overlay in place, and that's on the right there, if it wasn't obvious. And I think what I love so much about this is that one, it makes for a very cool looking video, uh, but two, and definitely more importantly, it's yet another example of FFmpeg, like QC tools, teaching and showing me something about digital video that I'd never quite experienced in that way before. FFmpeg is just a remarkable tool, and even these snippets of code, uh, which might be old hat to some of you, are, it can be powerfully illuminating for those of us who don't have quite as strong a grasp on the underlying complexities. And this form of visualization can also serve as a good segue into one of the last things that I'm gonna talk about, trash captions. I'm running low on time, uh, and I'll have to keep it relatively brief, but bottom line, there are a lot of bad captions out there. Why and how are very large questions that honestly I don't have all of the answers to. What I do know is that video is all about synchronization and timing, and if these things are off, they'll affect everything, and that includes captions. Uh, this EMEA L post, which I'm sure no one can read in this room, but check it out later when the slides are available, uh, it has a message from David Crossway of DC Video that hints at some of the potential issues here. Uh, it could be a problem at the source, it could be a problem that's occurred during dubbing. It could be a problem that's occurring with your VCR as you're playing back a tape. And working with large-scale vendors, we often get metadata notes, signal notes, that say something like information on line 21, uh, but no CC. 
And this is one of those areas in which we just have to place our faith in our vendors um, and trust that they did what they could to ensure, uh, to recover any usable information. If you're transferring your own tapes though, and you're still unsure of how to proceed, my best advice would be, one, get a waveform monitor, uh, as David Crossway advises, and use the line select feature to study the vertical blanking interval for the presence of captions. Or two, maybe the easier option, uh, have a calibrated professional CRT monitor as part of your signal chain. Uh, in my experience, if a CRT's decoder can't uh, interpret your captions, you probably won't have too much luck elsewhere. But again, though, what I love about this tool is that it taught me how to use FFmpeg and FFplay to examine these things on a deeper level in the digital realm. And here you can see how wildly off, and sometimes inadvertently how wildly beautiful, uh, trash captions can be. It's pretty clear to the naked eye that the time needed to clean up some of this uh, would likely just be better spent recaptioning the video in question. Uh, so to wrap up, uh, what's next for SCCU? There's nothing specific on the docket, but I do have a few ideas that just kind of came to mind. Uh, I'd love to see incorporation into vRecord. Um, that's something that I think could happen relatively easily. Um, Annie mentioned multiple caption tracks, uh, odds and evens split between English and another language. I need an example of this to actually run it through SCCU to see what the results would be. Uh, I think we could probably get there uh, if we have good test files. Um, more refinement of testing for the presence of captions by SCCU. Right now it just scans the first 20 seconds of the video, which we determined pretty quickly wasn't the best me method. And we've talked about uh, testing in the beginning, middle, and end of the video. Um, and this one's kind of outside SCCU proper, but I think we could all benefit from developing quality control procedures for when we either receive or create captions for ourselves. Uh, and then finally, I think, uh, there could be some way that we could better report on trash captions, something like you're shit out of luck or it's not gonna happen. Um, so with that, uh, I'll thank you all for listening and uh, open it up to questions. Thanks, Annie. Thank you everyone too. Thank you. Uh, we have about five minutes for questions. Uh, David Pluger. Our closed captions and subtitles the same? Um, closed captions and subtitles are not technically the same. Um, subtitles often will involve, um, although closed captions sometimes get into this a little bit, subtitles are typically interpreting the speech a lot more, um, and they're not as verbatim as closed captions are intended to be. Closed captions also include audio effects and other things that someone who can't hear would have to understand, whereas subtitles really only represent the spoken dialogue, so. But technically, they're in the same place in the signal. Oh, 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 as in like a technical sense. I don't know enough about subtitles specifically to, to speak to the technical well, side of will, them. Or how is it in PAL video? Is it in the same yeah. place? Or Teletext, which would be the, maybe Stephen could even jump in. It's Yeah, please, please do. Um, so we have off air recordings from UK PAL television in the, in the realms of hundreds of thousands of tapes. And we're, we're in the process of building or r and a teletext extraction workflow, and the, the teletext is more complex than just mm -hmm. captions, but essentially the teletext has a subtitles component in the data. Um, and my thinking is that it, it could be a sponsorship for Paul or another developer to, to in attempt to repeat the closed captions for US television, for, for PAL source. So I probably will get in touch with Paul and see if that's feasible, um, because it's a major, source of accessibility and discovery metadata, of course, and, mm -hmm. and we have a lot of it in our collection, and I bet there's other European television archives who have a lot of it, so yeah, it's very exciting, and maybe I can copy it for PAL. For yeah, do it. I might have missed it, but I was curious like how you were making any of this extracted capturing data accessible to the public, like if the SECs were like integrated into YouTube or your other media players, and I was just wondering what NYPL's policy was as far as making uh, archival video accessible to the public now, like if you are doing that uncaptioned, or if you have any requirements to make content accessible, even if it wasn't necessarily originally accessible. There are, um legal requirements, of course, and I think right now it's only things that are going up on our website that have to be captioned. And we have a 
master service agreement with a caption captioning company that will provide those services for us. In terms of things like this, historical videotapes, right now we're still in that kind of phase of digitizing, extraction, re-embedding into MP4s, which we should have provided code for, but it's on FF Improviser if you want. Um, and then hopefully those files, once they're made available, will have captions. But it's still very much a work in progress, I would say. We have time for one more, if anybody else has one last question. No? Okay, thank you very much. And we'll welcome Fabian and Stefan to the stage. Hi, everybody. Fabian is just arriving. He will start the presentation. I don't have a mouse here. Perfect. Welcome to our short lightning talk. My name is Fabian Würz. I'm from the Swiss Social Archives. I'm the head of IT and the digital archivist. And on the right, you can see Stefan Lenzlinger, the head of the archive of the Swiss Social Archives. So, the initial position. In the last years, our institute got more and more born digital archives from our donors. And these archives had really all kinds of material, um, focused on audio and video, but also all kinds of text, um, often word, but also kind of really um, rare formats. Most of the time we got them as hard disk, as USB stick, really all kinds of ways. So what to do with all these hard disks? The first thing, um, we introduced an OIS open source software, Docker Team um, Feeder. So in the beginning, we were really happy. You can see the happy archivist was saying, yes, we um, archived it. But like it normally goes, this were opening new questions. So the user asked us, how can I exit the archives? How can I, can I exit online? Can I also um, access the original masters or just uh, access copies? Um, can I embed your um, videos and audios into my blog, website, on Twitter, or whatever? Then there are also questions of our, um, our staff. What's about access right? We have also kind of closed archives, which are not, which shouldn't be accessible in online. And also was the question, what is happening with the metadata we have in the AES, which is separated to the OIS? Um, first, we realized we cannot solve the problem alone, so we did a collaboration with our partner institute, IASH, um, in Amsterdam. 
we started to um, sum up all requirements. First was online access, then the possibility of access restriction, a simple user interface, it should be open source, it should handle all kind of material, materials with a strong focus on video and audio, it should handle different manifestations, so an access copy, an original master, maybe different preservation copies. Then we had a problem that we have two different OIS implementations. In Amsterdam, they had Archivmetica, and we have DocuTeam Feeder, which are both OIS systems, but very different if we go to details. And so we were looking around if there's something which can fit to all these requirements. In the end, we decided to make our own project and called it um, Archival IIIF. Um, it's an open source, source software to present digital um, and born digital archives out of OIS. And because for us international standards are very important, we decided to base it on IIIF, which was already introduced yesterday. So how does it technically work? Here you can see what we already had. We had uh, an archival information system, we had our OIS system, and we had the rights management. So the first step was to build um, um, a surfer software who makes a bridge between any kind of IIIF image surfer and our OIS system. And the second step was to build um, a viewer to have an easy um, access. But of course, because it's IIIF, you can use any kind of IIIF viewer. You can use Mirador, you can use Universal Viewer, whatever you like. So the whole model um, is very um, dynamic. You can use it with any kind of OIS, any kind of IIIF image surfer, and any kind of viewer. And how does it look? Okay, I'll try to explain <coughs> in a few minutes uh, how this is meant to work. Um, little example. The user navigates to the online catalog of an archive. Let's, and let's suppose he's looking for archival material about the World Wildlife Fund. E everybody of you knows uh, World Wildlife Fund. That's what he finds on our website, and I admit it looks quite old-fashioned, but uh, perhaps it's the last time we show it in public because we're going to change the, the appearance of our online inventories very soon. At the bottom, you can see an entry entitled Electronic Acquisition 2002-2004. If you choose this one, you get an overview about the content in the viewer component of IIIF. It's browsable like a file system, and we designed it like this with intention because that's more or less the way the stuff is delivered to us. For instance, uh, you click on the folder Council and you receive um, the protocols of the managing board of the World Wildlife Fund. And you can click on this and you can, uh, oh no, I forgot one. On the right hand side, you have all the metadata which is presented in um, in the, sorry, where am I? <laughs> uh, which is, uh, uh, on the right hand side, you can see the corresponding metadata, such as uh, the title, file size, etc., etc. And this metadata comes from our OIAS and from our archival information system. And you can, you can choose among different manifestations 
You can choose if you want to see the access copy, the preservation copy, or the original master. Uh, in the same way, the system works with photos and with video files. We decided to choose uh, screenshots due to time reasons, but if you want, you can, uh, you can view this also in a live demonstration, uh, which Fabian will give you the link afterwards. Now I pass again over to Fabian. He'll tell us what are the next steps. The next step is going to production. So we hope we can do this um, in the next year. Um, we also uh, want to improve options for downloads and sharing. It should be possible to download um, a whole package or just a single file or also maybe um, a subfolder. Um, we want to um, um, add sharing possibilities. At the moment, we just have the IIIF sharing possibilities but you also want to integrate possibilities to sh share it on social media. Of course, we are really looking forward to IIIF 3.0 for the new possibilities um, for video and audio. It's still working very well with the 2 um, version, but with the free version, we can do stuff much more elegant. But we will support both versions. You can also use a few, we can just do version two, so. And we want to um, increase the possibility to search in description and the content. So if you have um, a PDF, you can also search the text in the PDF, or you have maybe captions, you can also search the captions in a video. And of course, um, we are open for more users. At the moment, it's mainly us and the International Institute of Social History but um, we had already talks with different other institutes. Thank you very much for your attention. And if you're interested, feel free to contact us um, now by email, or you can also go um, to GitHub. On GitHub, you can also find a live demo online. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we can take just a minute or two if there are any questions, otherwise we'll move on. Anyone? Okay. Um, I think we'll actually um, move on if we're out of time. Um, so we can welcome Jonas to the stage. Presentation set up. So. All right. Hello, uh, my name is Jonas Svatoš, and I work in the Národní filmový archiv in Prague on digitizing and long term presentation of our visual heritage in Czech lands. Uh, this short overview uh, will be about leveraging the concept of so-called object storage model towards a easier access to audiovisual data, mainly with respect to parallelization and uh, data safety. What motivation is there behind actually pursuing completely different way how to work with files? Well, traditional file systems tend not to scale well for audiovisual purposes. The storage subsystem is either large and slow or small and fast, right? Trying to overcome this, usually the clustered so storage solutions in digital preservation are based around SEN-like model, where there's a clear physical path between client and the server, usually iSCSI or fiber channel connections. This is complicated from an infrastructure point of view and tend to be a bit pricey as well. You get to choose between two ends, data redundancy and performance. What do you choose? Last but not least, the traditional file system access was not invented with microservices in mind, and the whole mesh, service mesh concept, and uh, the whole service mesh concept, does the implementation to these systems is usually non-trivial. So, what's an object storage anyway? It's a storage service from which data is 
uh, retrieve on a per object basis. One can look at object like a small archival package, where not only data, but also arbitrary metadata is present. This, dif this differs from a file system where every file has only a fixed set of parameters defined by the file system itself. Therefore, object storage is a bit like a database for files from where you read and write them via web APIs, mostly REST or uh, SOAP API. Any program capable of HTTP communication is therefore able to access them directly, supposing it has the uh, right credentials. On object storage, one can have multiple root folders, so-called buckets, for principal content differ differentiation. Speaking of folders, Physically, there are none. They are present only in the form of metadata to emulate the traditional file folder-based paradigm. Um, something about security. Uh, the barrier between, between data resi residing someplace and an application residing elsewhere then becomes only a matter of access control rather than how to make data accessible. To properly access the data, we must provide a secret uh, most usually two variables resembling username and password in a every HTTP request. This requires an effort uh, on the developer side to properly safeguard those secrets, supposing the object storage is publicly accessible. Even though there are many implementations of object storage model, they all share the same system and in majority also in the API. The API is called S3. It's a shortcut for super simple storage, which is a de facto standard due to the fact that the original implementation of Amazon's hosted product, called, also called S3, has become an industry standard not long after its adoption. Fortunately, they are not just proprietarily hosted, so-called cloud-based solutions, but open source implementations <coughs> exist which anybody can run on their own they differ in robustness, scalability, and complexity. In Narodní filmy archive, we implemented one of them called MinIO. So what's MinIO? It's an S3 storage server built with simplicity in mind. It follows do one thing and do it well, Unix philosophy, given the fact that it's written in the Go language, uh, which was or, uh, originally co-invented by, by one of the Unix pioneers, which the source code compiles into one sole binary. S3 servers try to remove the burden of working with shard files by splitting them into several pieces and working with them in parallel, and MinIO is no exception. This enables multi-gigabyte read and write speeds on spinning disks, as the chunks are split between the underlying disks, multiplying the performance. To take it even further, it employs erasure coding algorithm uh, to ensure data is duplicated for redundancy and corrupt chunks are replaced on the fly. MinIO can run both in standalone mode on a physical server, say with uh, JBoot drive with 60 disks, or in cluster mode with hundreds of containers, with uh, everyone with, with each with its own data storage. As for fixity, S3 API has mandatory fixity requirements, which enforces checksums, checksum calculation during data ingest and its retention during the life of the object. When chunking is used, hashes are calculated in parallel and those are then hashed together, calculating something like a called a hash of the hashes. You can see it in the image, and as for the number after the dash, this is actually a number of chunks. So you can divide the number of chunks, uh, the file size by the number of chunks, and you get back the, the size of the chunk. Uh, S3 specs uses MD5 function, which is slightly outdated these days, as the API is stable since 2006. But it's better than nothing, or not, no hash at all. The resulting checksum is directly available to the application and is present in every HTTP response from the S3 API to 
to detect any changes made to the data. And there's also a tool called S3MD5, which can be used to verify the efficacy of local copy of the data against the API. Uh, Minio is able to hold the data in several locations for redundancy. So there's no need for proprietary write anymore, rate anymore, as the function is superseded by the uh, erasure code alg algorithms. When starting the server, one has to specify a list of directories where Minio should make the storage. It is expected that it, those will be empty drive mounts, but those can be any directories as well. The redundancy ratio is config configurable, but the default is configured in a way that even half of the drives, if half of the drives are gone, the data can still be accessed. Write access needs majority of the drives, though. MinIO's erasure code coding is based on the very fast algorithm called Highway Hash, which is able to hash multiple gigabytes uh, per second on a single CPU core, so it's pretty fast. When the system detects an error, one of the chunks will be automatically constructed from the other parts present in the system, be it bitrot or a crashed disk, which, will, which was just replaced. Uh, MinIO Min has also the ability to enforce a global warm mode, so-called, uh, which stands for write once, read many, which means the storage provides only read and write APIs, nothing else. So no data can be lost even if the user or the applications would want it to. This further enforces data retention as no application is able to modify the data after it has been ingested. When working with AV material directly, like playing it or post-production workflows, API access is not yet feasible because the application don't support it simply. Luckily, S3 API has several wrapper implementations. For example, FUSE, file system in user space driver, which enables us to work with object storage buckets like with any other file system. This mode of access retains the benefits of parallelization so multiple uh, chunks in read or write mode, but must be carefully used, especially in operation uh, where frequent or parallel metadata access is used, which can be a problem due to the fact that metadata retrieval is relatively expensive on S3 compared to data access. One good example is a folder full of DPX files which I wouldn't recommend you to store on object storage. Rather compress it with raw cooked. As for tools, every data storage needs uh, some tools to do housekeeping tasks like listing a directory, creating, deleting without actually working with it. And object storage is no except, ex exception. MinIO itself has two clients a web UI which is available by default and it's part of the binary and also a command line uh, application called MC. Don't know why they call it MC. Maybe Minio C would be better because MC is also a midnight command. So, yeah. The tool tries to emulate uh, standard POSIX commands like copy, move, find, etc. But there are several other client applications <coughs> like SCCMD, which is also command lines based. And for GUI lovers, there's always uh, CyberDuck, which is almighty to all the uh, cloud services and FTPs and so on. So this concludes my quick overview. And here are just some links for your studying pleasure. Thank you. And I would be welcome for any questions. Um, thank you very much for this. Uh, actually, I just have to, uh, I've, I've just been involved in a project where you stored stuff on an S3 Ceph implementation. Yeah. And have, are there any uh, concerns about the fuse um, mount performance wise in your experience? Because I have not found this, to be honest. Well, um, we're not using it for uh, writing, 
yeah. because I would not probably recommend using Fuse file system for writing to no, anything. No, not for writing, just, just, just treating because they had to implement all the code that you would just have access file system, like all the routines that iterate through files. Yeah. You have to implement it unless you mount it, right? That's right, yes. Um, Okay, then, then I didn't develop this. And just one thing, it's I'm, I'm, I'm flirting we with can, Jerome right now on, on about S3 ways. patch to extract metadata on local mm -hmm. S3, so about the metadata extraction stuff. Okay. Are there questions? Hi, Stephen from BFI. Um, so thanks so much, that was a wonderful. I've been uh, considering a Ceph implementation, but found it too complex for my brain to get its hooks into, but uh, would you say that MinIO is a simpler solution than Ceph, or much of a muchness? Well, no, there's no differentiation between metadata server and the content server, and there is no fencer required, because this is just, either it's a standalone uh, server, or it's in cluster mode, which means that they have to be at least three of them to, to have, uh, how to say it, uh, that so there will be a majority of the clusters in case of split brain. Can I ask two? Is I know that's terrible etiquette, but okay, great, thank you. Um, I should pick your brains after for sure. <laughs> yeah, but, of um, so most of your users, day-to-day -day users, do they use the web GUI or do they use CyberDoc or how do they move their their files in and out? Actually, we don't use the web UI at all. Mm -hmm. We use it only through uh, external applications. Mm -hmm. So it all. all it only sits uh, as an API on mm -hmm. the web service. So the web UI is really simple. There's no, not much you can do, but mm -hmm. it, it is there. So you can access it through web, web if you don't have any other application that can work with S3 API. Mm -hmm. Cool, thank you. Other questions? Remote questions? Sorry, me again. Uh, you said it's, uh, it has uses MD5 as a hash, but yes. then you had the E tag in the metadata blob. Oh, well, it's only a naming uh, issue. I, I, I really don't know why they call it E tag. Did you verify this? Because in my research, yes. it was like it was not MD5. It's something like the Ceph S3 that I have to deal with. It was not MD5. Well, as for S33 specs, th it's, all, it's really an a MD5 algorithm. Okay, because but the, the thing is that. Uh, the hash you get from the service is yeah. the sum of all the hashes of all the of chunks. The, of the chunks, you know, and you yeah. need to need to know the chunk size to yes. recalculate yes. this. And if there are multiple chunks, yeah. the e tag, so called e tag, has a yeah. dash in it, and then the number after the dash is the number of chunks. So therefore, you've got the size of the whole object, and then you've got a number of chunks. So you can divide the file size by the number of chunks, and you get the uh, si f uh, chunk size. Okay, that, and I was yeah. referring to the uh, S3 MD5 uh -huh, script, uh -huh. let's say. It's a Python script, I think, which can automate, automate this. But you can do it also manually by hand. OK, thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Jonas. <laughs> and we'll welcome Gareth to the stage next. Oh, it's gone. Sorry, give me a second and I'll find it. I think I'm all right now. Yeah, it was all right. I think it was closed. So it's all right. Right, okay, um, so my name's Gareth Arbold. I work for the Metropolitan Police in the Digital Video Forensics Lab. Um, so I'm gonna talk a bit today about some of the challenges and strategies for dealing with those challenges we have in dealing with video forensics. Um, so I personally head up a data recovery team, so we tend to sort of fix broken video mostly. 
Um, I started off in 2005 doing various broadcast technical roles and then about nine years ago moved over to um, video forensics because I found it quite interesting and I like the techie side and it's, uh, lots of puzzles to solve so that's kind of my, my sort of take on that. Uh, right, so I'm going to start with a cliche and try and define forensics a little bit. So really we're talking about applying scientific principles to collecting, examining, and analyzing evidence. So the sort of cornerstones should be really that your results should be reliable, repeatable, and verifiable. And uh, by that I mean, can we trust our results? Um, if, if I do the same test again, am I gonna get the same result? Or if someone else does that test, will they get us the same result? And looking at perhaps why that, might be, that difference might be there. And then verifiability, so can we actually check those results to, to verify that what we're looking at is, is the truth or what, what we assume to be correct. Okay. So uh, we're gonna go through a few different things. We're gonna go through the end state, so what's the goals of the actual work that we do in our lab. Um, we're gonna look at, um, uh, sorry. Uh, we're going to look at uh, what, what we do ourselves, um, different, different departments in the, within the lab, so we've got a few different bits to cover there. Uh, the diversity of the source and format, which is one of our biggest problems. Quantity, not quality. We get a lot of different videos, so we'll talk a bit about that. And then acquisitions so are how we get it from the different sources that we receive and ingest. So what do we do with it once we've got a sort of blob of data off a machine? Um, okay. Uh, right. Okay, so uh, one of the first things we're probably looking at is, is live intelligence. So let's say somebody's missing or we're trying to identify a suspect. So it's just about getting a quick, urgent viewing of whatever source we... Oh, hang on. I'm not showing you any of my slides at all, am I? Sorry. Um, I thought that wasn't quite right. No, it's still not doing it. Anyone help? <laughs> Oh, yeah. How did you do that? <laughs> okay, magic. Sorry. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, so yeah, so that's a bit better. Right, so yeah, live intelligence. So uh, quite often a lot of the systems will have multiple cameras. So it's just about getting, getting whatever you're receiving working so a police officer can come and view it for, from our point of view. Uh, right, so then the, the other end state we go for is, is a much more long-term goal of getting the evidence ready for presentation in court. Uh, that often involves compiling multiple different sources of video rather than just one particular device. Um, and then the other thing we get a lot of is infrared sensors are quite attractive to spiders. So yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is quite common, sort of eight hours of this in front of a critical camera. Uh, right, so next uh, I'm going to go through a bit about what we actually do within the labs so some of our different sort of services. Uh, so there's this downloads and data recovery, which is what I do. So we look at physical data recovery and logical. So physical is in damaged media. I try and palm off as much of that as I can to the other lab because I prefer them to deal with the, the myriad of problems that hard drives can cause. But I do deal with optical disks. Um, and then we've got the logical side, which I'll talk to about in a bit more detail later. Um, OK, yeah, then we've got court compilation. So this requires taking all these different sources that we're receiving and, and trying to get them onto a timeline and exporting them in some sort of homogenous format, which, which can be quite trying. Um, and then we've got enhancement, which I'm sure you've all seen your crazy CSI man in a pair of glasses and being reflected, or you know, a lot of that's nonsense. We, we can do a couple of cool tricks. Um, there's, there's a trick called blind deconvolution. I think some of the astronomers use it where you, you try and correct for motion blur. Um, I won't go into the science of it now because it's not my specialism, but the other one that's quite fun playing with is frame averaging where you can take multiple pretty terrible images of an object. And as long as you've got a vaguely static object in front of you, you can line them up and average them and come out with something a little bit better. Um, 
I was trying to get the text I've written on that bit of paper back. If you can see that little that line wasn't happening there, I went a bit too far with it. But um, sometimes you get good results with number plates with that sort of technique. Okay, and then the other thing we do in the lab is comparison. So is the person in the reference image, which would be the, the big, nice, clear photo, the same as the person in the terrible, sort of awful, low-res, poor-angled CCTV image. Um, they try and take a good scientific approach to it in the lab, and it's, it involves a lot of work, and they've done a lot of research into it over the last few years to get really tighten up their processes and sort of take a scientific approach to that. So, yeah, so you've got these three strands that we work towards. We work towards downloads, enhancement, comparison, and court compilation. So, moving on from there. Diversity of source and format. This is by far our biggest problem. So, CCTV systems, there are hundreds of these things, probably thousands. No uniformity amongst them. They have different codecs, different, different resolutions, different standards. Most of them are rushed to market very quickly, so a lot of them don't particularly work very well either. Um, so, that's a huge obstacle for us. Uh, you've got mobile devices. Lots of mobile devices out there at the moment. Many of them creating quite non-conformant bit streams as well in the sense of um, there's, there's been a big problem with H.264 that we had over the last few years where a lot of them don't spe uh, specify the color range correctly, so whether they're using limited or full range. And we found a lot of the times that like, people were trying to enhance video without awareness of this, and you found that they would just completely clip out the blacks. and. You've got, I think it was Motorola were quite bad for this, where they were li specifically labeling their bit streams using uh, limited range when it was in fact using full, so a lot of our tools were automatically throwing that information away until we sort of came across it. Uh, the other big problem with mobiles is people tend to deliver the material by social media, so email or WhatsApp and everything ends up horrifically compressed and comes to us in this, like, hey, we got the video, but it's just, you know, like two pixels wide and rubbish. Uh, then we've got dashboard cameras, which have probably come into proliferation, especially in the last few years. These are a nightmare as well because they come with their own metadata, which means they also come with their own players. So burying down to that metadata can be quite troublesome for us. The other problem as well is because they're using SD cards that aren't really up to the job. These SD cards are left in these devices. They're recording long, long time, especially like a taxi that might be driving in their car for a long portion of the day. And the SD cards are often quite badly hammered by the time they come to us. Um, so what can we do with all these different formats? Well, certainly Media Info is an amazing tool that we use a lot. Um, FF Probe, Exif tool, really good starting point. When you've got when you've actually managed to acquire the data and you've got it in front of you, this is a great, really saves my life tool. Um, and then we've also got the old legacy formats that tend to come to us as well. Um, I won't go into too much detail on that because I think you guys are pretty well covered on that. Uh, oh, the only thing I would mention actually relating to the previous talk about the closed captions was we do have one slightly different format that you guys might not come across too much, which is a multiplexed VHS where people use uh, a custom device to multiplex multiple cameras into a single VHS tape. So they effectively do like camera one and they'll be using the vertical blanking to encode camera number and timestamp. And so we have like a big bank in our lab of custom, well not custom, but of old, these old devices that used to be used in, in situ because we do still get old tapes coming in sometimes. Uh, right, so. Proprietary codecs, proprietary file systems. The DVRs make up a new file system pretty much every time they make one. Uh, I'm sorry, I keep abbreviating DVRs. I mean the, the CCTV systems, the digital video recorders. Um, so they, they have hundreds of different weird file systems that have no like uh, documentation out there. Uh, very odd media containers. The CCTV systems produce a different file format each time, pretty much. Proprietary replay software, very difficult to work with and unpredictable data integrity. Um, so, okay, so a bit about the amount we're, de we're dealing with as well. So let's say um, that a lot of uh, vendors try and go for this mystical 28 days of video. So uh, average two terabyte disk in a system, recording for 28 days, let's say it's an eight camera system. So we're dealing with about 5,000 hours of video on a single disk. Um, and you're probably dealing with 400 kilobyte 
video, which is not great. So sort of, you know, you've got manufacturers selling a unit, saying it's a 1080p unit, but you're getting quality like this out of it. So it's, it's a bit sort of defeats the point somewhat. Um, ideally, you'd be getting it around the sort of 2000 limit, but that's never going to happen. It's complete luck of the draw. Sometimes you will get that. Other times you'll get as low as 200. Now, the problem with that is you've got all these different resolutions and all these different bit rates. And that leads to this problem. So the way the DVRs cope with recording all this data is when a disk fills up, it doesn't simply stop. It starts deleting the oldest material and writing back over it. So if you've got a very high resolution system with lots of cameras, that overwrite cycle is going to be very short. So you might even be talking about three days. So you, you, you know, no time to wait and everything. This is maybe like a three-day um, capture period where you've got to get the unit, turn it off, and bring it somewhere to get the data out. So you're working at quite sort of short deadlines sometimes. Other times, it's great. They said it's a motion record, and uh, you might have a few months. But it's, it's completely variable, so there's no way to really predict it. Um, we can't keep everything, because if we kept everything, we'd have have to have our own storage archive, and we just don't have capacity for that. So we target the clips we're working with, and we clone data by exception. So if it gets to me and I'm doing data recovery stuff, I'm going to work from a clone, because I'm going to hammer the disk with all sorts of code. But otherwise, we, tr we actually work from a live device, which is kind of a bit of a no-no for digital forensics. But we have to, because a lot of the time, you you're kind of mercy to the custom export that the DVR provides. Uh, okay, so then we're going to move on to a bit more about that. So we've got different levels of work where we are. So uh, the Met is ridden with, sorry, the, the London is ridden with, piece, with um, CCTV. So we probably, I think, I, I tried to do a little quick search, and they think there's about 600,000 CCTV cameras just in London alone. So it's a lot, of, a lot to deal with. Uh, um, so initially, if there's a problem and we need video, the officer, police officers will try and do it. Then you've got a, a group called the Vido, which are specially trained police officers. They will try and acquire the video if the standard police officers can't. And then if no one else can do that, uh, the top 5% comes to the lab to be dealt with. Um, so like I say, out of all the different sources, CCTV is the hardest, and it's the, the file systems and the front panel DVR extraction that is, is the hardest thing to deal with. The other problem we have is there are very few extraction tools dedicated to dealing with the raw hard disks. There are a couple, but they're quite young products and they don't yet really cover, uh, certainly not the older systems that we get. So they're getting there, but not there yet. So what do you get? So when you, when you go to do a download from a DVR, you'll get some sort of screen a bit like this. It's always very sort of, you quite often you'll find that there's like a normal, which is like standard recording alarm, which might mean motion, or motion, which might mean motion. So the, the terminology is very interchangeable. They just sort of make it up as they go along. Um, so you disable the overwrite as soon as you turn a unit on, which is to say to stop it trying to record over the oldest stuff, and then it makes it a little bit safer to work on the live system. And the first thing we try and work out is just is it on there. Um, okay, so then we're dealing with uh, a lot of legacy hardware, so we try and you keep our legacy peripherals, it's quite important. So if a, if a USB stick is less than two gigs, I shove it in my drawer and I keep it and I scream at people who come near me for them. Um, so, and I've got, I've got like weird USB mail to USB mail cables in there and all sorts of things that I, I harvest and hoard like a little troll. Um, so uh, the broken ones, so like I said before, inherently we deal with the toughest 5%, so most of what we get sent is probably broken in some way or another. Um, like I say, a lot of the DVRs are rushed out the door and the software on them is usually terrible. So you might find, it's hardware as well actually, so you might find like a power supply on one of them is awful. So as soon as you plug a USB stick in the front panel, it drops the voltage and the whole thing comes crashing down. So a lot of problems like that. Um, so when we do extract the hard disk and we start looking at the data, we use a Tableau uh, usually. Um, any write blocker that's been sort of verified will do. It doesn't have to be Tableau. It's just it's what we're using at the moment. Um, so then normally 
I'll go and start looking at, it, at the data in a hex reader. It's the only way to do it. If you've got a, just a, an empty, shiny disk, which sometimes people think they're being helpful by bringing you a completely no context hard disk to you, um, which is fun. Um, so I'll start looking normally for uh, MPEG markers. Luckily, a lot of the units are using H.264 now, so I don't know the sort of hex aware amongst you might recognize the um, 00167s, which you tend to get at the top of an iframe of H.264. Then what I normally do is once I find anything that looks like a codec I recognize, you'll find there's about 30 to 50 bytes before it, which is usually the proprietary CCTV system data. If you're very lucky, you'll find a marker like the one I've highlighted in yellow that repeats at a set interval before each frame. Um, and then, then what I do is normally I've got a bit of code I wrote to um, take samples based on markers, so then I'll line, align the data, which makes it a lot easier to read. So you just take a sample from the beginning of each frame, um, and then you start trying to sort of put the pieces together. So I've highlighted a couple of, a couple of columns there. The, the first one in red, I think, is the size marker, simply because if you look on the left, you can see the offset for that frame. It looks similar, it's not quite the same, but quite often they work from a particular offset on the disk, so the, the frames don't always reference zero, sometimes they'll reference a, a section further down the disk after an index table. Uh, so once you've got that, you'll be looking at things like camera number, and the only way to test a lot of this data is to take actual frames out throw them into FFmpeg, decode them, and see, and if you're really lucky, there'll be an on-screen on display. Um, here's a couple of other things I've done. So it's all about annotation. So once you've got, once you've worked out a system, you start annotating. So here's another CCTV system. Um, luckily, some of them use like epoch time and dates, which is the sort of Unix timestamp. Um, unfortunately, a lot of them don't. A lot of them make up their own ones. We've got a little list of about I think it's about 30 odd completely made up timestamps they've, they've sort of invented for a single DVR. Um, here was some work I did on an MP4, which goes back to, I think, the talk from this morning or before lunch, just before lunch, I think it was, um, where this was a move atom that had been corrupted. And luckily, we had a sample file from the vol header. This was from an MPEG 4 file rather than H.264. MPEG-4 is much easier to work with because you can reverse engineer if the iframe header is missing, but H.264 is a whole different ball game. But um, this was, I think we had to rebuild the index by mapping the MDAT section of the MP4 again. It is doable, it's, it's hard work, but it is doable. Um, you just have to look for patterns and deal with your codec at the time, so it's a bit of a piecemeal process. Um, and this was just for research. Um, this is an AVI header. So there's a lot of information in there, and it was actually, you didn't need to deal with almost any of it. It was just the top two fields, the file size was wrong, and I think the number, total number of frames was wrong, and fixing that pretty much repaired the file. So sometimes you can sort of take shortcuts to fixing things. But I just put that there because I'm showing off, really. Um, so, right, so acquisitions, I find the footage. So we're dealing with a lot of footage and a lot of data. So. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, I found the, the marker, and then I found the timestamp, and I've got a little scanner that will then pass every single timestamp and turn it into human readable text, which means then you can check against the frames and work out if the data you're looking for is actually on there. I scanned a four terabyte disk and took a sample of the timestamp of every frame on it. It produced a 27 gigabyte CSV file, which was just massive. So. It's a lot of data to wade through, so then we had to filter that in turn. So, you know, your command line tools are almost invaluable here because a lot of data programs just won't open files that big. So, um, extremely useful. Um, I think I just used Find on CMD to do that, which worked surprisingly well. Uh, right, so let me just scroll down a bit. Okay, so. Um, then once you've got a bit of an idea of the, the timestamps on the disk, you can then start to get, build up a picture of the structure of the disk as well. So the structure is quite important because you might have uh, a system that's going like camera one, two, three, four, or you might have half an hour, a chunk of half an hour allocated for camera one, then a chunk for, for camera two, and it might go down in chunks like that. So every disk is going to be different with that. Or you, you might be dealing with some sort of horrific fragmentation. I had a horrible one um, last year that was um, an XFS file system, which is quite fragmented, but 
it was a very strange old one that none of our tools would actually recognize. So it's sometimes, sometimes it's a sort of curse and a blessing when you get an actual file system to deal with. Uh, but yeah, so I, I mostly code in C Sharp, which is probably not sort of like a lot of people prefer Python, but I inherited C Sharp libraries and uh, learned to code on the job on my hit time. Oh, am I still there again? Why is that happening? I don't know why it's doing that, I'm sorry. It's on the right one in here. I was on, oh, I think I think it was that one before that. Yeah, I need to go up a bit. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. You was the left and arrow. <laughs> okay. All right, well, anyway, I needed a breather anyway. Right, so, okay, so uh, skipping on from there. So how do we, once we've actually got video off, um, so I'm just gonna talk about what happens when we get the files out of the DVRs themselves in their native format. Um, so generally when I'm carving, in the previous step, I'd have just ripped out H.264 and then thrown it into FFmpeg, whereas this is what we would do if we've got uh, one of the many Myriad files that comes out of a DVR. There are lots and they are all rubbish, um, without question. Uh, you've got .dav, .264, which could be literally anything. You've got .mp4s, which are complete lies. They are not mp4s. They're just made-up rubbish that's called itself .mp4. <laughs> Infinite trash. Uh, so um, I do feel strongly about this. So yeah, so here's an example of some of the players we get to deal with. Uh, the, the worst type of ones you deal with are when you get uh, a single file that has lots of cameras embedded within it. Uh, you can guarantee those aren't going to work very well normally. Um, and most of the players, if you do try and export a single camera, it will either transcode or crash normally. Um, okay, so one way we deal with that is screen capture. So it's, it's not great. I don't like screen capturing personally, but sometimes you have to. Um, we've got some weird old codecs that nothing will play back, like um, analog devices used to do some slightly more obscure wavelet type ones, and there's a weird one called SmackM, I don't know where that came from. Um, and GeoVision used to have like a whole cluster of slightly modified codecs that were sort of like GX264 and things like that. Uh, so we take our player, we render it on the desktop, we screen grab, and we capture it as a raw RGB. Oh, have I done that? Is it because I'm pressing down, maybe? Probably, yeah. Oh, right, okay. There you go. I can do all that, but I can't operate PowerPoint, apparently. Sorry. <laughs> um, all right, yeah, there we go. So, uh, pros and cons. Um, so, not all formats... Um, hang on. I skipped ahead a couple, haven't we? There we go. Yeah, I was there, wasn't I? So, right. uh, so pros of screen capture, it's a pretty simple process. You don't need to be too technical to do it. You open a player, hit go. It's more city capture area, hit go, and then you're kind of done. And the bonus is a lot of these players will have their own overlay of text. So they might say the camera number or the timestamp, which they're decoding internally. Um, luckily, they've moved away from that a bit, but we still get enough legacy systems for that to still be an issue. Uh, so, yeah, you've got lots of cons. You've got an unavoidable um, color space conversion. So if you're dealing with enhancement, it's kind of a no-go, really. Um, <coughs> dropped frames, because you're dealing with quite high bandwidth, especially if you're trying to capture one of the more modern, like, 4K systems, it's not great. Scaling issues. Um, it also means you're junking up your workstation PC with these infinite numbers of, of executables sometimes installing direct show codecs that should have been buried in the ground many a year ago. Um, okay, you've got to deal with it in real time, so if you're dealing with lots of footage, that's a problem, and um, you then still have to go and transcode that before you hit your editor because you have to conform your file because quite a lot of the time CCTV is working at odd frame rates and our screen capture tool captures each frame as it appears rather than st at a set frame rate. Um, okay, so... Um, 
Transcoding, on the other hand, uh, I, I usually prefer this. You take a file, you throw it into FFmpeg. You might need to use the forcing flag, so the minus F before the input file name, to force to H264. That has saved my life so many times, I cannot count. Uh, and then at the moment, we're going to lossless H264, uh, which I'm sure lots of people will say is not a good idea. It's certainly not great for editing with, but until FF31 becomes sort of edit compatible, I don't think we're... I think we, some people are arguing about us moving back to ProRes, and I'm still standing my ground, but we'll see. Um, all right, so where are we? Uh, so we can maintain the color space if we transcode, hopefully. It's less vulnerable to clipping if you stay in the YUV space. Um, we're less likely to crop the image edges, so sometimes with the, the players, they will trim out the edges of what you're playing back, which is pretty bad. Um, there is no reason CCTV should ever be interlaced, but some of it is, and it's just death of me. So yeah, that FFM is better at dealing with that. Um, it's faster than real time, mostly, and you don't have to deal with the executables. There's a lot of, a lot of pros, but not everything's compatible. It can't catch the overlays, and um, timing can be lost. So sometimes if you're forcing, it loses all the sense of timing, and you'll get the file that just goes whoosh, like that from A to B. So you'll then have to manually do something like FF Play to diagnose it, count against the OSD on the number of seconds, and then rewrap it again with the seconds um, sort of calculated into the file. There's sort of different approaches to that, but that's, that's what I would do. And the other, the other thing we do is rewrapping. So sometimes it can be enough to take one of the native files, rewrap it into something like an MP4 or an AVI, and then uh, you transcode. Um, sorry, uh, so you can do that as a pre-stage to transcoding, which can sometimes make things easier. Um, trial and error involved in all of this, and uh, sometimes rewrapping can help with the, uh, the time code errors. So I think I'm almost wrapping up now. So currently, uh, our ingest is, yeah, like I said, it's H.264 um, lossless. We can form to 30 frames a second. We now scale everything to 1080p. Um, and then, just for fun, we master to a DNX mov and distribute as an H.264 MP4. The reason we do that last stage is because we're using Adobe Premiere at the moment, and it's awful for exporting chapter markers, so we're sort of forced to go via the mov and then use FFmpeg to keep those chapter markers, because if you export a native MP4 from it, you can't keep your chapter markers, um, which is probably a conversation for another day, but there's very little in the way of chapter marking and menu systems made available for video now, unless you want to be sort of stuck with HTML replay. Uh, so then it goes to the court system. That's also problematic. So it leaves us. We give it to an officer. They take it away. And then it goes through a horrible wireless streaming service that degrades live, ca live encodes on a laptop and turns what sort of rubbish video you've got into like a pile of something you'd probably not want to slip on. And um, we do have a house in-house presentation team um, who try and educate officers on how to present in court, and they have their own bit of software that, that's kind of a nice multimedia mix. So you can present PDFs and videos and audio in the same place. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to wrap up there. Thank you. Couple minutes for questions and. We'll start over here with the remote. First question from Samaya. Curious to know if there's a good mobile device that is producing video that's okay quality and not a nightmare to deal with the digital video files afterwards. Assume not, but thought I'd ask. Um, I hate to say it, but Apple aren't that bad. And that's where I'm going to stop. <laughs> they do seem to label their bitstream correctly, so I can't be too cross at them. But, um, actually, but they do do one thing that's pretty bad, actually. They encode to H.265 under the hood, and if you put the wrong setting on your phone, they will live transcode that back to H.264 when you extract, so I can retract that. No, they're all a bit crap. And second question by Peter White. Acquisition levels. Surely you would need an image to work with evidence package due to the possibilities of accidental metadata changing when police officers attempt to acquire footage and fail? Well, it depends on the level you're working with at the time. So if you're dealing with um, 
let's say like non-critical evidence so i don't know like um uh, shoplifting something where, where the crime type isn't proportional enough to justify the lab resources because we are quite finite then then i think there's, there's an acceptable risk factor i mean it depends when you talk about metadata i mean in cctv a lot of the time you're just looking for what's in the picture time codes are I mean, there's a, it's a debate in itself, but the time codes are kind of unreliable anyway because you're dealing with, there's a lot of issues that can go wrong with time codes. So, you know, if you turn a system on and off, there's every chance the time code could jump or is it syncing against the internet? Or with modern IP systems, do you have, you can have a camera that syncs against its own time clock, an MVR that syncs against its own time clock. So you can be dealing with multiple sources. So metadata, metadata in itself isn't entirely reliable. So... I think as long as you've got the imagery you're interested in, that's key. Thank you. That's super interesting presentation, thank you. I'm just curious, so in terms of like the, the, all of the transformations you're doing from like the point of acquisition to core presentation, like do you ever um, get challenges in terms of like the accuracy of what this, all of this, trans, the, the, whatever you're presenting in court is and whether it truly reflects, you know, what was originally captured by the CCTV camera, and then is it just a matter of like expert testimony or like having a documented process, or like how do you affirm that? Well, yeah, as it stands, we don't get challenged very often on it. The, the main challenges come with the comparison work because that does require a, a strong degree of training to, you know, assert that you've got a degree of confidence over whether someone is the same in one picture as another. That's, that's I think, the biggest area, and the enhancement work as well. The enhancement work, obviously, is more questionable. But a lot of the time, I think, people tend to believe what they've got in front of them, which I think, as you were talking about earlier with the authenticity, I think is going to become more of a problem in the future, because I think imagery is going to become more, more, uh, more easily compromised and more easy to challenge. I think that the bonus with CCTV is that is actually quite hard, because you've got to you know, you've got to jump into like a 24-hour recording and, and do it quite seamlessly. And I, I think it'd be interesting as a challenge to run, actually, to try and see if people could do it and, and what the effect and what the results of that would be. But again, people at work won't let me do that because they think I'm, a, I'm setting, the, setting up myself up for trouble. So. <laughs> Hello, David Frugo. I've heard that there are systems who save space by dropping frames over time. Is that, is that not usual anymore? Um, it's, unfortunately, some of the council systems actually do that. And what they do is they have a system that, it, like from an engineering point of view, it's clever, but from an evidential point of view, it's ridiculous. So what they do is they save their I frames, P frames, and B frames in separate files. And they will drop, first of all, they'll drop the B frames, like on week two, and then week three, they'll drop the predicted frames, and then week four, they'll do the lot. So that can happen. Thank you. We have a short 15-minute break. Um, so if you have other questions for Gareth, you can ask him then. <laughs> oh, so there's coffee and treats over here. And um, our next presenter, Gina Chang, will be starting at 3.20, if you could be back in your seats by then. Thank you.
then with Gina Chang when everyone is settled. Thank you. Hi. Um, my name is Gina Chang. I'm a conservator from the National Museum of Norway. I'm responsible for the conservation of contemporary art. The official title of my job is the conservator of new art forms, which literally means that I take care of the artworks that cannot be categorized in the traditional old art forms, such as paintings, sculptures, textiles, etc. So I do mostly work with the time-based media artworks and then uh, installations. This is my third time attending at uh, No Time to Wait and the first time presenting. So I'd like to uh, first thank all of you, uh, the organizers and participants for building the event and community to be worthwhile to be part of it. My presentation today deals with one of the causes of why we are here yesterday, today, or year before. Yeah, yeah. Oh, they are. <laughs> 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 More. Uh, many of you, if not all of you, have concerns on or struggle daily with obsolete technologies and objects, assessing the risk, devising innovative strategies and tools to be dealt with the digital objects, software, hardware that are soon to be obsolete, if not already obsolete. The anxiety is here and out there. We don't have time to wait. Um, by the way, yesterday I learned a new word, imposter syndrome, which I found that the word not only explained my existential anxiety in recent years as a time-based media conservator, but also fits perfectly as an introduction to the general direction of my presentation. In other words, I'd like to talk about the conservative anxiety of obsolescence, a sort of uh, PowerPoint version of the goalie's anxiety at the penalty kick by bean vendors. To do so, I want to generalize understanding and problematization of obsolescence through and beyond the field of museum and archive conservation. Because just like the comments made by a gentleman in the audience yesterday, it has bothered me whether the way I have understood and pro uh, problematized the obsolescence is too narrow or exaggerated or framed and delimited by my own profession. At the same time, I believe and hope as a conservator who is also a citizen, a human being, that what I do and care professionally are aligned with and have a relevance in outside the walls of museums. So please allow me for my articulation of the obsolescence in a broken world way in broken English. The presentation takes a cue from Stephen J. Jackson's essay, Rethinking Repair, published in 2014, that advocates the possibility of a new epistemology of new media and information technology based on broken word thinking. It is a thinking or exercise that focuses on breakdown, maintenance, and repair rather than growth, innovation, and novelty. Broken word thinking is to see the world as always in peril, as Jackson puts it, a fractal world, a centrifugal world, an always almost falling apart world. Just like the Victorian epistem influenced heavily by the second law of thermodynamics concerning the irreversibility of natural process. This appears to be pessimistic, but what's crucial about the broken world thinking is that the world is also a world in constant process of fixing and reinvention, reconfiguring and reassembling into new combinations and new possibilities, a topic of both hope and concern. Jackson calls our attention to the world disclosing properties of breakdown. That is to say, at such a breaking moment that we learn to see and engage our technologies in new and surprising ways. For example, instability of systems or infrastructure is largely unknown or invisible until breakdown. Second, the broken world thinking foregrounds and hails repair, maintenance, and care as an ex aspect of technological work that brings about moral relation to the world of technology, 
redirecting our focus from production and innovation to sust sustainability. So far it has been a brief and thin rundown of Jackson's thesis, but I think it's enough for you to catch where I'm coming from, at least, although it's not enough to know where I'm going with this. Okay, going back to the conservator's anxiety of obsolescence, you are now looking at the new National Museum of Norway, which will open in 2021. Since 2016, the construction of the new building has been going on, and we are all very proud of the new museum building. However, the public opinions about the building have not been so kind. They criticize the building's closed architecture with very few windows, as it reminds them of a prison or a mausoleum. On the other hand, I was thinking, wait a minute, isn't it also true that museums are sort of mausoleum or memorials for the object? The very thing or unthing that is coming into museum will be obsolete one day in the world out there, sooner or later only matters. It's our job to prepare things to become obsolete. Don't wait, no time to wait. Maybe go even further, go ahead in time and wait for it. The museum will house about 400,000 objects in our collections, ranging from medieval panel paintings to queen's dresses to architectural models to teaspoons to underwater drones and to performance artwork. So a few days ago, I came across an exhibition technician making mounting supports for these beautiful objects. Both of us didn't have any clue what they were first. I thought they were belt buckles and she thought they were keyholes. Has anyone had this idea? They're called tsuba and came from Japan. A tsuba is the hand guard of Japanese word. It serves several purposes. It's for balancing the sword, protecting the hand of sword holder from attack and kind of status symbol for a sword owner. Thus the Japanese word tsuba became an elaborate piece of art far beyond its practical use. They lasted quite long period from 14th century to the 19th century when people stopped sword fighting. And as you can gather from all different names describing the parts of the sword, the Japanese word technology and art was and is highly specialized in terms of their makers and consumers. The encounter with the suba brings about the first aspect of obsolescence. Unlike a general assumption about obsolete technology or things, they haven't completely vanished. They linger and persist physically, but become somehow unknowable, invisible, or quaint to the larger population. If you twist this thought around, things obsolete, uh, obsolesce because of not paying attention to or losing interest because some changes occur in our life cycle or priorities, etc. The obsolescence is thus political, social, economical, cultural, temporal, and local as much as technological. Then is obsolescent concept for every conservator, not just conservator of time-based media? Obviously not. Take this strange object made by a young Norwegian jewelry artist, Emil Gustafsson, for example. The object is an interactive brooch that measures the distance between its wearer and the others who she will have a contact with. It runs a single program patch that turns the signal from the proximity sensor to three different colors, like green, yellow, and red. Since it was brooch made by jewelry artist, it entered in our design collections initially. But then, since it has electric tech stuff, so it was turned over to me. And then it all started to gotten out of my hands. If I were an object conservator, my documentation and conservation planning would have been pretty much straightforward. I would document its dimensions, materials, colors, and wrap it in an acid-free paper and put it in a box for storage. But no. Anything with the red-made technology, digital interactivity artist intent turned the red lights on me. Obsolescence, malfunctions, ephemeral, since the artist only explained what it does, not only how, uh, not how it does what it does in order to document the working, work defining properties and to devise a preservation plan that best accommodates the artist's intention and to prepare for the days that the mini Arduino and the sensor becomes obsolete or broken, 
I felt nothing but to cast as many as safety nets possible or, uh, ordering uh, possible. So I, I ordered some same parts, noting the wiring and the range of proximity sensors and finding a similar program patch, et cetera. So it seems that even within the conservation field and within the same institution, there exists different expectation on the life cycle of the same object and how to conserve it. Within the context of conservation exhibition of jewelry item, the demise of social distance measure brooch <laughs> appear almost impossible as long as the matrix, a material matrix withstand the time. However, within the conservation of interactive contemporary art, there are so many things are at stake. On the other hand, even if I did cast all the possible safety nets to think about until the work is show, uh, shown again, you don't know when actually, it is forced to obsolescence by just being on the shelf. To store away something is to temporarily forget about it until we record it, which happens very often, especially to the works by the minor artists. The intermittency between each time their works are shown are just about too long for the information about the work and the components that can be gathered, documentation, uh, or uh, test knowledges of the conservators to be relevant anymore. To discuss the life, death, or becoming obsolete of an artwork with the artist is not an easy task, especially when we together try to document the range and intensity of the artist's intention covers on art work defining or significant properties. When it comes to the work that has digital contents, the possible scenarios dealing with both the defining significant properties and preservation strategies seem to the eyes of conservators in different fields in breach of common sense, conservation conventions, or ethical guidelines. Nonetheless, the artists are generally very comprehensive about the situation and shares our concern and anticipation about the risk of obsolescence. We proactively reach out to artists upon her work entering into the museum, survey the existing digital contents and documentation, and advise on the preparation of documents and files for submission. And we explain why we do our digital preservation in open source format and standards. I'll interview them about their working methods, technical and conceptual details of work, asking views on uh, various what ifs. What if things break down, become obsolete, how the artists want us to proceed with the various preservation scenarios, or just to let destruction continues. And we diligently make generation trees as a relationship within the work or related works. All these measures are coming from single motivation, heavily influenced by the anticip anticip anticipation of the work will come apart in one way or the other. Thus often I feel the very strange but strongly strong kinship with a funeral helper. I transmit, transmit my professional interests, concerns, and anxiety to my clients, ensuring the artist's intention alive even after, after their death. I'm also afraid and cautious about the discussion about the preventive conservation measures, anticipating of obsolescence with the uh, it will uh, inevit inevitably influence the artwork and the artist alike, potentially restricting and censoring the future artistic choices or engendering uh, a hybrid version of an original artwork. Then what is obsolete? What does it mean to be obsolete? Washington um, Post ran the obituary for VCR when the Japan-based uh, Funai Electronics Cease production of VCR at the end of July 2016. And it seems the tone was that VCR has been generally regarded as obsolete long before then. But according to the section 108C in US copyright law, a format is obsolete if the machine or device necessary to render perceptible work stored in that format is no longer manufactured or is no longer reasonably available in the commercial marketplace which means VHS or VCR is not obsolete. When you turn your attention to the other parts of the world, we also see different pictures of obsolescence. Take, for example, Nollywood. The Nollywood film industry was born in the early 1990s during a severe economic down 
turn in Nigeria. Kenneth Nebu had an excess uh, number of imported VHS video cassettes, so he decided to use them to shoot Nigeria's first straight-to-video movie, Living in Bondage. By 2007, an estimated 9,000 feature-length film had been made, and it was estimated 45 films were being released every week. In 2013, Norlywood ranked as the third most valuable film industry in the world. While the people in the Northern Hemisphere generally regard VHS as a passé, obsolete, it had its revival in the South, demonstrating grassroots resilience and optimistic entrepreneurship. Seeing Nollywood phenomenon together with the Ghana's e-waste salvaging industry recalls Jackson's moral technology in broken world thinking. We now realize that being obsolete is different than decay. It is designed and thus forced, having no relation to the object's function and utility. But value, that's changed. The obsolescence is planned and calculated within commodity culture in the developed parts of the world. The decline is value. Uh, the declines in value forces to scarce, disappear, and invisible only to show be the way to the countries in which their resources are scarce. <laughs> then can we also say that preservation and maintenance, which attempts to prolong the life of things that have already been sentenced to death, are activities with or without intention of resistance to the destructive force of capital interest in technology. Another unexpected outcome of the one uh, media becoming obsolete is the rendering its properties and shortcomings as some of, uh, sort of esoteric novelties. Yeah. In uh, 2017, crowdfunded stream movie Kung Fury is all about that. The movie shot entirely digital is not only full of reference to the 80s culture, but also has overtly VHS look. I mean the look of VHS that has been rented out for a thousand times in Blockbuster. This digital uh, simulates tracking glitches with nothing but fetish and the commodification of the TK malfunction and imperfection, overuse sign analog medium that has actually technological and historic grounds and has formed the cultural specific memories in the VHS generations. In the same token, rather serious outcome of one media become obsolete and the salvage attempt usually through migration to digital media and upgrade this total change in the significant property of work as well as artist's intention. This is the case of Norwegian artist Shell Bergingen, 10 channel video installation shipped to from 1995. Like Woody and Steiner Bashulka, Bergingen artistically uh, invested heavily at time on the materiality of video signals and the reference to TV industries. He often collaborated with Dave Jones, who supplied custom-built video sync, and most installation works are based on live manipulation of video signal. The artists and work invest in media specific, uh, specificity is essence of media in modern sense, <coughs> such as ontology of phot photography uh, images, video, films, etc. What happens to the essence and authenticity medium when they are forced to be lived digital live? So the year was 2012 when we pulled out ship two again for the exhibition. To the horror of both conservator and exhibition technician, they found what we call a symphony of obsolete nightmare. Basically, there was nothing there that could work in the year 2012. Software, hardware, media, and expertise. In the end, they found this gentleman through a closed mailing list who used to work at the American Embassy in the 80s as an IT guy. Uh, so why can't we just hack the time? Well, it seems that the problem degradation of instability of media persists in the future. In the Kittler's dictum of, of information theoretic materialism, um, loosely, uh, it can be uh, saying it can, if it cannot be processed, it doesn't exist with the digital entities. If you can't process, so it is, it is not there. 
In the scene at the Tyrol archives, there was a mention about uh, a blackout, which wiped out all the data of the surface of Earth. Ironically, all the old obsolete media and papers survived. I found this kind of sci-fi imagination of archive in the future very interesting. I'd like to use it as an analogy for the present day collective psyche for the technology. When faced with a total new situation, McLuhan or famous says, we tend to always to attach ourselves to the object, to the flavor of the most recent past. We look at the present through the rear view mirror. We march backwards into the future. Thus, the dystopia of year two uh, 2049, built on the collective amnesia induced by the blackout, seemed to throw the, our own anticipating gaze towards the technological innovation back us. We are constantly reminded with the instability and eph ephemeral ephemeralness of digital technology that will always near perfect. This scene in particular, when K passes the corridor of the obsolete replicants grotesquely archived, if we consider the replicants in Blade Runner are more human than human, the archives are nothing but the blatant self-portrait of our own future as obsolete beings. As much as we are impressed with the efficiency of the tools we are working with, we feel also threatened by the language and working of the tools that surpass our understanding. We are collectively marching towards a horizon where we bec become outsourced and outdated or more accurately, the horizon is receding towards us in lightning speed. To wrap up my talk in a way relevant to the open source community, I want to join me at the Riddles of Tower of Babel. I always wonder about whether the fall of the Tower of Babel was supposed to mean as a good or bad thing. The God was angry at the man's pride and destroyed the tower that has been built in cooperation and univer universal or uh, ideal language. The loss of perfect language and the ensuing misunderstanding among the men must mean pretty bad. On the other hand, the diversity of language in the hindsight doesn't mean doesn't seem bad at all. As I learned, not only the open source tools that help us to resist obsolescence, obsolescence of things that we preserve, but also the languages that the engineers build the tools obsolescent. The reasons can be attributed to the many things, lack of funding, people lose interest in maintaining, repairing, and caring in the project. It goes also in the opposite way, as a token to the innovation of the tools and language to be better, more perfect, they seem to be settled with us sacrificing the old versions. As Bruegel repeatedly raised and uh, destroyed the Tower of Babel, the Tower of our ideal community and, and languages seem to go through the cycles of up and down. Thank you. Thank you, Gina. Do you want to take a couple questions if we have some? Any from remote participants? Okay, we'll welcome Brianna Toth then next. Thank you. Somebody closed it. Sorry, I had a tab up here that's gone, gone now. now. <laughs> so give me one second.
my screen. How do I get it on that screen? I have analog notes. Okay, thank you. Um, hello everyone, thanks for hanging in there. I know it's close to the end. Uh, my name is Brianna Ta, and I am a film preservationist at the Academy Film Archive in Los Angeles. So it's a pleasure to get to present to all of you about video, which is something I don't get to work with right now in my current job, and I, I really miss. Uh, I also want to thank Ashley and Dave, who um, encouraged me to submit something and present, um, which I probably wouldn't have done on my own. So, um, What I'm going to talk about is an extension of my graduate research that I've continued outside of school. And it really does touch a lot on a lot of the issues that we've been talking about. For example, the round table last night about the transference of knowledge, but also I'm going to talk a lot about collaborations across disciplines um, to work towards preservation, which we've talked a lot about today. Peter talked about um, using the Raspberry Pi and like when he didn't have a remote control and it was really wonderful to hear about some of those projects. So, the issue that I'm focusing on is that with the technical knowledge to repair and maintain video playback equipment is aging out of the professional field. The ability to steward this equipment is also at risk, but not often part of cultural heritage when we discuss it. What I argue is that these skills are often um, at risk as much as the carriers themselves. And that if we wish to continue our work with this medium, AV archivists, engineers, and technicians must mobilize to pass on technical knowledge from one generation and community of practice to the next. Uh, I want to pause here and say that nothing I'm going to talk about is probably very new to any of you, but my point is that this is a persistent and unresolved topic, which does still need our attention. So I want to give you an idea of the context of where my thesis is coming from. Again, this might not be new, but just so that you can understand the limits and constraints of what I will be discussing. So the core tenant of a lot of this is that all moving image media is dependent on playback equipment. And although knowledge obsolescence is not specific to analog video, which is the only format I will be discussing, um, this, that it will just be the focus of this presentation. So, as we know, all existing analog video formats are obsolete, and none are considered a preservation format. The second point is that the lifespan of the media is, it was not built to last, a lot of it was made for the commercial market, and the deterioration is irreversible and inevitable. So I think of this as a fugitive medium. Third, none of the playback equipment is new. It's made from fragile and delicate parts that are prone to malfunction and require routine maintenance which all contribute to this sort of grim trifecta we see here, often referred to as the magnetic media crisis, um, which essentially is the marriage of the limited time left we have to preserve these tapes before they are completely unplayable, the dependency on obsolete playback equipment, which has implications that the content is irrevocably tied to the preservation of technology, and that without the preservation of that technology, these historical documents cannot be salvaged. <coughs> in addition to the sheer volume of material on tape formats that far outweigh the resources to tackle the available, to tackle the backlog. So although uh, the year does vary depending on who you talk to, it's generally agreed upon that we have about 10 to 15 years until the majority of magnetic media will be unplayable and not able to be preserved. So how did this happen? When I originally made this PowerPoint, I had just seen this film, so very fresh in my mind. Um, basically, 
I will refer back, and I, I cite heavily Mike Casey, who wrote an article in 2015 entitled, Why Media Preservation Can't Wait, The Gathering Storm, where he combines degradation and obsolescence to these bullet points we see here. And I'm not gonna read them to you, but essentially what this means is that there's no tech support. There's no parts being made, and there's no technicians being trained as they used to be. So I also would like to add that a lot of these skills are now being folded into the job of the archivist, regardless of how we were trained or if it's relevant to our, our training at all. So when I was thinking about this issue, I wanted to begin um, to see you know, what, had be done, what had been done. Can hindsight give us any insight? So I started compiling a list of just every instance I could find that related to knowledge obsolescence, related to analog video decks. And I started feeling like the list was becoming a little unwieldy and maybe just a, a paper document wasn't the best format to keep this kind of record. So I made a timeline vis visualization of everything I found. And hopefully this video will play. Um, So on the timeline, uh, this includes conferences, task forces, projects, grants, reports that are all color-coded by category. Um, the time span goes from 1978 to the present and currently contains 49 instances. And anyone can submit an instance, and you could as well from my professional website. Um, I would like to thank Ashley Bluer and Linda Tadic, who also contributed to this timeline. I was very grateful for their input. Um, but I should note that in an effort to keep this equipment focused, lists of resources like carrier-specific publications and media archiving degree programs and certificates were handed over to the EMEA <coughs> Continuing Education Advocacy Task Force and included as appendices in a report that I helped them write and submit this year. So uh, I really like to think of this timeline as a data set or a literary review, um, if you're thinking of this in sort of um, a methodology context. And what can be gleaned was, uh, I thought, three main points. Um, and one is that there was an emphasis on physicality. So there was, I did feel like there was a lot of knowledge transference related to the chemical makeup of magnetic tape. Um, and attempting at one point to try to find a video preservation format, cleaning techniques, proper storage standards, and video error identification. Um, there was also a huge push towards cataloging standards. In the 90s, this was believed that documentation was the first step towards preservation and would assist with record sharing and be more competitive with grants, specifically those that were film related. Playback equipment it was also mostly absent. Um, if included, it was a brief mention or footnote, and the main focus remained carrier and object specific. So the five instances that I could find that I felt were focused on analog video playback equipment were the 2005 Artist Instrument Database by Mona Jimenez, which actually led to the next instance in 2008, the IMAP Obsolete Video Playback Equipment Project. Um, there's also, in 2012 and 2014, Michelangeletti's EIAJ refurbishment project, which also inspired the BAVAC All Hands on Deck proposal that was submitted to the NEH, which Ben Turkis was part of, along with Kelly Hayden and Lauren O'Connor. And in 2019, um, actually quite recently to when I was doing this research, UNESCO uh, just launched a magnetic tape alert project. However, the only survey conducted that specifically addressed video playback equipment is from 2008, and that was the IMAP Obsolete Video Playback Equipment Project. Uh, it had several potential projects for the future that it wanted to gauge interest for. The first was the creation of a template that could be used to help inventory and catalog such equipment, which actually was, was made. That is the Artist Instrument Database. Um, the second was an online registry of playback equipment and the third was a cooperative effort to share parts and expertise. However, the other two projects, 
uh, were never materialized after the report was published. Um, so another thing that I drew from the timeline was case studies, you know, like specific things that people had done, like can, can we model some solutions after this? So I'm going to discuss two of those briefly. The first approach is one that we're all pretty familiar with, and that's mentorship with hands-on technical proficiency and getting under the hood. And the instance of that that I would like to give is, again, BAVAC's all hand on deck NEH proposal, um, which involved a 30-hour training curriculum that was going to be integrated into audiovisual preservation workflows and education programs for VTRs, as well as a hands-on training workshop with 10 audiovisual archivists who would go back to their institutions and train their staff. And third, to developing an online resource that would make the curriculum freely available and assist with maintenance and repairs of VTRs. However, I should say this grant was never funded. It was submitted twice to the NEH and then again last year to the Knight Foundation. So the pros and the cons. So obviously it's thorough, it works, it's been done a lot. The knowledge keepers in our field that really have the most skill learned this way. Um, the cons, it cannot be applied on a large scale with the time that proficient training requires, and the skilled techs qualified to teach are diminishing in number. Also, the sheer volume of material needed for preservation overshadows available time and labor. So moving on to the second approach, which is sort of the other side of the coin, bottom-up strategies and large-scale migration and digitization, which I thought was personified by Indiana University Bloomington's Memnon Sony partnership, which is an academic and corporate partnership, so it's rather unique. Um, basically, they started the Media Digitization and Preservation Initiative, which is spearheaded by Mike Casey, who I mentioned uh, previously. He's their audiovisual director of technical operations. And what this project is doing is focusing attention on migrating content from legacy formats, whether it be onto new tapes or digitally transferring content to another. So it's not about transferring skills, it's just about transferring the actual physical thing. It started in 2013, it's still going on. Uh, the goal was to transfer 350,000 significant media holdings by 2020. I don't know where they are on that. When I checked in June, they claimed they were 96 percent finished, but then I couldn't find any more statistics. So I don't I don't know exactly where it's at at this moment. So the pros and cons of this, obviously, again, it works. It's happening. Um, it, another pro is that it marries the interests of industry and archives and hovers between motivations of preservation and profit driven profit driven production, where proprietary knowledge can be more freely shared. The cons it's difficult to replicate. Um, again, reconciling this tension between commercial interests of a company and preservation priorities of smaller collecting institutions that may not have as much material to migrate as uh, the in Indiana University is difficult to find. Um, in addition, companies don't want to create competition by providing more service, provi service centers. So although uh, Sony Minon created a huge digitization center. They don't really want to create another one because they would be competing with themselves and basically uh, cannibalizing like their profit. Um, another con is that the specificity of this relationship would be really difficult to replicate. Um, there are really unique circumstances that made this project possible, including institutional su support from the provost, um, surveys that began in 1998 to the present that assessed all of their holdings and created a task force. And also, they had full support and cooperation from their IT department when they were creating all of their workflows. So I just want to say I think both of these case studies, um, they, they do work, and they, but they have cons, but I don't think either of them would work by themselves. I think that we need to be a lot more creative when thinking about this problem. And I think that there's a lot of questions that need to be answered that are centered around scalability, such as every institution's resources vary along with their collections and those collections needs. You know, what skills do we need now? We've assessed it in the past, but what are they today? 
and on what platform do people want to share this technical knowledge? So I designed uh, a survey uh, to ask these questions because I wanted to know. Um, the link is up there. I also have the link that I can give you, but it will be widely distributed in January. Um, and I believe this survey allows the inclusion of multiple voices from different generations to provide an accurate understanding of knowledge obsolescence and contribute to a more nuanced understanding of what our current preservations are by including playback equipment and technical skills and cultural heritage. But I didn't stop there. So in designing this survey, I went back to my timeline um, and I just, I just really believe that we don't have to reinvent the wheel just because things didn't work. I still think a lot of the work that people did in the past is really important and we can build on that. And I also think that that work really needs to be acknowledged and that we can't just have this like all or nothing attitude where that's a bad idea, it didn't work, so we can't use it. So um, I looked at two specific instances that I drew upon in designing these questions. And the first was again, the Bayback All Hands on Deck grant proposal. Um, and what I found really unique about this proposal is that they were the only ones in all of the material I came across that actually listed and defined the skills that they wanted to teach. And everything else that I found, um, people stressed the need for skills and training, but they could never elaborate on it or define it. And then I also went back to the MEAP survey from 2008 and was kind of thinking about, you know, like, how do we want to share this? What are the platforms? So as you can see, the apprentice models on there, workshops from BayVac, partnerships from IU, um, and then the survey. One of the big takeaways is that 81.3% of the respondents said a co-op for spare parts would be a beneficial future project. At the time, they thought the vend that they could work together with vendors to reproduce parts or purchase them in quantity to negotiate or reduce costs, which I don't know if that would be the best thing to do now, but I, I do think that we should revisit that possibility of if we should have a co-op or a consortium. And then the last few things that you see up here, in addition to this research, I conducted 18 different surveys. So these other potential options were things that people mentioned when I was talking to them. Also, there's just one of me. I have no research team to help me. This is something I've been researching for a year and a half. So, you know, my, my means are limited. So a lot of the information we need to make the survey meaningful, I don't actually have the resources to do. But I think we can comp continue to build on existing reports that focused on statistics of analog media within various collections, like the amount, institutional resources, preservation needs, and build upon them or at least get an idea. So I also say this because knowing which formats dominate collections holdings are significant since technical skills and equipment are often format specific. Which formats are currently in collections in need of preservation and without available resources or expertise can help us understand which urgent skills, what skills are most urgent to pass on since we probably can't do it all. Um, as I said before, the all hands on deck grant proposal was submitted three times. Um, and what's bittersweet about that is that although it was never funded, I can work off the feedback of the program directors. So I did speak with Morgan Morrill, who's Bayvax preservation manager, and he went over all the questions that were discussed with him and how he thought maybe some of that could be addressed. Okay. And, you know, I have them here. Again, I'm not going to read them to you, but, um, you know, how does throwing more people in the mix help? Would this involve job creation, your target audience, et cetera? So basically what I hope my survey will do is that it will map format specific preservation priorities and trends. You know, are they geographically specific or concentrated? Um, what volume of material is at risk? Um, are larger collections that we know of, have they already preserved all of their preservation priorities? Um, and then can we strategically match resources, skills, and needs? Because I really think that's the only way that we can tackle this problem is by pooling what we have, but we have to know what's out there. Um, and to use these results modularly, because I think every case is going to be really unique, it's really not going to be a one-size-fits-all solution, um, and cater to the multiplicity of institutions and collections to adapt to the scalability of their various situations. 
Thank you. Thank you, Brianna. Um, do we have anyone else who hasn't spoken yet today who has questions? Actually, I have a question. Sure. Um, so I don't work much with video, but a lot of this is relevant to the work that I do with audio as well. And um, one thing that I've thought about as a barrier to training my own staff or even training um, incoming staff, uh, interns, for et cetera, uh, for example, um, is um, like you don't want them to tinker with the like one of three machines <laughs> that you have available. Um, and so even for um, an institution like mine, I work at, a, at NEDCC and we're a vendor basically. Um, even when we have grant funding, for example, to buy more equipment, um, we, I know exactly who I'm competing with to, pur to purchase that equipment and it's often like larger vendors or institutions that have money and um, we're just like bidding against each other on eBay for the same thing and it comes down to whoever <laughs> like has the most, most money and stayed up until 1 a.m. to get it. Um, so it's made me think a lot about the distribution of where the equipment actually ends up and this idea of sort of like hoarding equipment. Like I think all of us want to do that because you want to have a, like a room full of all your backup equipment. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, but like even at my institution there's, there's um, a challenge to that. Like we don't have a room full of extra playback decks. Um, <laughs> we have like a, a few, a few extras. So I wonder if there's some way of understanding, um, uh, some of the way that we can can pool our resources in a way to understand where, um, if you know, if you need to buy something, it's yeah. maybe not from. You know. I mean, I think that's the goal of the survey. I'm sorry if I didn't explain it very well. It just I was trying to cram a lot in, but it does ask questions like what are the formats that you have, do you have equipment, do you have trained staff, and so the idea is that if enough people respond, you know, maybe you have parts to something but that's not your preservation priority, or maybe you have some but there's not enough of it to make it a motivation but there's five other institutions that have a similar preservation priority, then you can actually combine those needs together and maybe get it done. So that's kind of the idea is that you can, if it can be mapped, then things can be strategized. But without having any sense of what you have to work with, you can't actually do that. And I don't think it's, I don't, I'm really against people working for free. Like, I know that like, everyone's like, do it for the love, whatever, it's great. I mean, do what you want in your spare time. But, you know, I think it's, I think it's crucial that if you do want to, you know, incorporate people that are trained or older engineers, that you do respect like the skills that they have or find something and that just expecting somebody to train somebody in addition to the job they already have and how much they're working is not an option. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna go to somebody who hasn't had a chance to speak yet. Constantine Wiesinger, uh, Saxon State Archive. Uh, thank you for that wonderful presentation. And two, or one thing where I think that, uh, that it's really necessary because uh, regularly I stumble upon small institutions or uh, production companies who come, go out of business and they regularly throw out their VTRs or playback equipment and we didn't have the chance yet to uh, um, accumulate it. So that uh, is totally approved for me that this is necessary, such an initiative. And just a quick question, do you also target with your survey uh, European or German uh, archivists? Because that would be of great help, I think. Yeah, I think it's as big as people want it to be. Um, I think the challenge is really getting enough respondents to make it a meaningful survey. Uh, one of the surveys that I'm actually partnering with is um, a survey that actually took place last year. And it was um, a group of students, but they ended up only focusing kind of by accident because it's where they work on academic libraries. And so we had been in dialogue with that. We were both kind of interested in the same thing, but that their survey was really focused and very much supported by um, SAA, the Society of American Archivists. So we really wanted to pool our, resorts, our resources and our results and really like see what we could get like together. Um, I think it is key to get smaller institutions because I think originally when I was thinking about this survey, I was thinking of places like 
Stanford or even like UCLA where I, I feel like their main preservation priorities for the most part might have already been taken care of, that this might not actually help them that much. Um, and that I think it's also crucial to not just get the survey out to um, the field of archivists that deal with media, but just general archivists, where there might be something in their collection, but they're not an AV archive. Thank you, Brianna. Um, I think we're, we're gonna move on to our final round table um, for the day and keep things moving. So we'll welcome Joanna White and our final round table. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, no time to wait for this excellent opportunity to, uh, to talk about um, the no time to wait effect. Um, so I'll just read the introduction. Uh, working as an, auto, um, an audiovisual archivist can be an isolating experience. Conversations about metadata, checks on codecs and wrappers can lead to pained expressions from colleagues taxed enough with their own technicalities. Thoughts turn to expensive vendors offering one-stop solutions that make all these difficult questions go away. But then you discover a small paradise where people like yourself gather and share knowledge under the banner of open source. So this panel today brings together developers and archivists who have benefited from the generous support and encouragement of the No Time to Wait crowd, um, and who reflect upon the impact this exposure has had on their career and developments and work practices. So I'm gonna start with the introductions. I'm Joanna White, as you heard yesterday from the Media Archive of Central England. Um, Last year, I was very curious about FFV1 uh, with Stephen McConaughey at the BFI, who um, extended an invitation for me to take part in a roundtable. And from that point onwards, I've been accelerated um, my, my kind of activities at the Media Archive of Central England, implementing lots of open source um, softwares um, into the workflows. And there's no looking back. I love no time to wait. <laughs> Hello, so you may remember me from talking yesterday. Uh, so I'm the main creator of Matroska that many of you use. I'm also a VLC developer. And I've been on no time to wait one, two, and four. Hi, um, I'm Kieran O'Leary uh, from the Irish Film Institute. I spoke yesterday. Um, and I've been at all four, no time to wait. And the whole thing is um, very, very important to me. So it's nice to be able to talk about it today. Hi, I'm Jonas Svatos. I talked just a few minutes ago. I come from Narodní filmy archiv in Prague. It's my fourth year in digital archive, audiovisual archiving. I originally come from IT. And it's also my, I've been to all uh, no time to wait. And I was always fascinated how uh, deeply is the idea of open source embodied in the whole community, and that's why I'm coming back every year. Um, okay, so straight into the first question. Um, what impact or change have you experienced following interaction with the No Time to Wait community? And how might we define what the No Time to Wait effect is? Um, does anyone want to start? Shall I start? <laughs> Steve just said there, Kieran, you like to speak. Um, <laughs> um, I guess my, my experience with the community itself, I guess, kind of started a bit before No Time to Wait. Like, um, my interactions with people on the EMEA L mailing list, I guess, on Twitter and different things like that, and then eventually on GitHub. Um, I'm pretty sure FF Improviser didn't, didn't exist before. Yeah, no, it was invented, I think, a few months before, maybe at the EMEA conference before. Um, the first no time to wait. But I, I, I kind of knew some of these people, but I'd never met them in real life. And so I think it was probably Dave Rice um, um, asked me if I was interested in coming, and I was like deeply honored and terrified about the whole thing as well, because I'm I've got like social anxiety disorder, like like I was diagnosed with it a while back. Even though I think I'm as Steve says, I talk a lot, but like I'm actually can be quite shy sometimes and so the idea of actually just meeting those people was a huge barrier to overcome and like 
meeting Dave and Ashley was actually, t and Rito was like terrifying. Um, but they were just super nice and uh, always have been and I felt like so welcomed here. And um, it was just great in terms of like what is the effect. I think um, probably myself and Joanna and maybe, I don't know, Jonas as well, we have, it's probably just an accelerated development after the first one that we went to. And, um, um, it's like I just soaked in as much knowledge as possible from all of the talks and talked to as many people as possible. And I think I just tried to approach everything with an open mind. And um, I just came back and wrote up about a four-page document that I sent around to everyone saying these are the things that people in our community are doing and some of the kind of the, the philosophies that they hold and this you know, approach to their work. And it seems to work and it's a viable way to do things. This, um, engaging with developers, with standard specifications. It's, it's, that, it's the crossover um, with, with all the different people within, um, the different types of people within uh, No Time To Wait, I think is what can be so powerful about it. Um, I, would, I would agree with that. It's the overwhelming welcome. That I remember the first year, I was just absolutely overwhelmed with it. And, and definitely tooling up, you know, the, the available tools um, through the No Time to Wait community as well, just the things that you can implement more easily because you, the developers are in the same room as you, and that, that's really helpful, you know. I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing. Um, I would say also maybe the effect for me is, is the, the kind of feedback as well that you, you are encouraged to give and that you just want to give when you've received so much from, from like, Dave and from you, Kieran, and Ashley and, and others too. Um, you just want to be able to share that and pass it on. And that, for me, is the effect. It's that kind of, it turns you into a bit of a channel for no time to wait. Like being here today, this is very going against the grain for me. I would never do anything like this. Um, but I want to because I really admire this community and I want, I want it to succeed. So. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I would totally agree with the fact that uh, as we are, everybody uh, a little bit socially awkward by default, that was so uh, great to, to, to come here, I actually uh, feel that there's no barrier between the high profile, let's say, uh, people and newcomers, and uh, especially when it comes to uh, like uh, searching in the dark, let's say, like that uh, you know that you're not alone here, there, and you have maybe the same ideas and there are people you can talk to and actually that you can reach consensus. And that, that's one of the key things, I think, that we can reach upon something, yeah. Well, I think I'll talk about the human level later, but in, times, in terms of work, for me, the no time effect, no time to wait effect, uh, was uh, the difference between the first no time to wait and now at the first one we were just trying to convince to use Matroska FFV1 and half of the people were very skeptical that they it could be useful or why would we use, they use something they never heard of. And then we're now at uh, no time to wait for and it seems that most people are using that. Uh, I remember at no time to wait, two people were saying, oh yeah, now I'm considering it. I, I'm probably going to use it, but still we had no idea. And now it, it happened. And uh, uh, I think it's actually because, almost only because of this conference and probably uh, from the, uh, the work from Dave and Jerome and Ashley and spreading the word. Uh, Actually, a question for you, Steve. Something you said yesterday that when you when you launched Matroska, happy birthday, I mean, you had absolutely no experience with video at all. So how has the community helped helped you in that? Well, I did a bit of a video, analog video side project in school just for fun, but uh, also studied a bit video compression at university, but uh, I had no idea what even the fine file format for video was. Uh, uh, I mean, here I still feel like an outsider, I just, but it seems like most of you all learn by yourself, uh, like you as well. Uh, so, I, and here I'm still learning, uh, I, like every, every year I'm learning a lot just coming here. I remember, um, 
I think some tweets from four years ago from you where you said you'd learned the term born digital for the first time yeah. from coming to this. And there was a couple of maybe even normalization or something might have been a new normalization, term. Yeah. Normalization, uh, fixity, which was built in Matroska, but I didn't know it had a <laughs> existed for as a term. Uh, so for the archivists on this panel, we have a question quickly. Sorry, Steve, just for a minute. Um, have you discovered new pathways to progression in your career, allowing for greater focus on the work of the individual within your institution? Well, as for, for me, I don't see it as a career path or anything like that, because I've been to uh, like computers way before I joined AV. But uh, I think that for most of the people who do not come from the uh, computer science background, this should be inherent in the, in the edu education as well. And I think, I hope that this conference only bridges the gap between the, the time where there was nothing and the time when this is all embodied in the, in the curriculum, in the, for example, I know, PNP and other um, programs where uh, one should uh, be able to to suck these things not only uh, in his spare time, but all, all as a as a as a part of his education. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think the out, I think um, a lot, lot of the work I was doing before No Time to Wait. Um, some of it was kind of in live production, we'll say, but a lot of it was still kind of experimental. Like ev even the first when myself and Rito were presenting on the um, taking film scans and turning them into FFE one, you know, we were just acknowledging that there's, there was a gap here, you know, and then with, it didn't quite work, which is why we needed raw cooked. But I think um, when I came back, you know, uh, it's legitimized the work, and instead of just kind of tinkering away in my spare time, I ended up getting like developer in my title. I've like had several promotions since, and I'm like, I'm a manager now. I really think that came from, like, I think I was legitimized by being at this conference and actually speaking and t talking about the work and uh, that people didn't like criticize it that much or anything. It was all really positive. So I, I give huge amounts of credit to No Time To Wait and all the people behind it as well. That it really, really helped me. Um, yeah, I would agree. Um, I feel that just in a very short space of time, the association of No Time To Wait, the cross collaboration and, and the types of people that it brought into my world um, really helped me um, implement some significant changes at the Media Archive Central England, and I'm very grateful to them for their bravery at allowing that to happen as well. Um, it became a bit of a thing whenever we were presented with an issue or an anomaly that we couldn't quite quote. I would say, shall I just tweet the guys at no time to wait? Shall I just tweet the community and have a word, you know? And Dave and Kieran particularly have been absolutely amazing in, in supporting us in this year. So, um, Also, Pathways, I would say, ultimately, the last year has led to my new career at the BFI, which starts next week. I'm very excited about working with Stephen McConaughey, um, who I think is a great advocate for open source. Um, so yeah, Pathways, definitely, this place opens up all sorts of doors that could, could surprise you. Um, so next question. Um, am I right in thinking that the original concept behind No Time to Wait was the urgent need to address obsolescence of videotape? Um, equipment and media, and are we reaching a point when No Time to Wait has achieved its original intention, raising awareness of videotape vulnerability? Well, I can give it a go, but I almost never work with anything analog. I mean, uh, I'm usually uh, very digital, even long time ago, I didn't I, I used to DJ, for example, in Paris, I was almost the first one using computers to DJ because I didn't like vinyls. So I couldn't tell much about the analog world, uh, but uh, certainly, yes, I, I like to uh, help making the transition better. We were talking about this at lunchtime, and I was, I was like, it's been so long ago, and I was trying to remember the original goals of um, the first No Time to Wait. And it, it, I mean, it seemed to be very much aligned with the Preforma project, um, regarding like you know, the actual um, like open source formats um, and, and tools surrounding them, and very much so, yeah, videotape um, 
you know, the, the, the race to migrate our collections was very, very much a part of that. I think over the years, it's become less and less like FFE1, Matroska centered. It's really more about this kind of different open approach to work and these like um, intersections between all these different parts of our community. And I, I think it's had, I think it's had a, a, a huge influence um, in the larger like no time, uh, non no time to wait community. I'm not gonna like I'm like Amia plays a huge part in it as well, but um, like I, I remember if um, there was a panel um, at FIAF about like two years ago that myself, uh, Jerome, uh, Bert, Clem um, Bert Lemons from Pact, um, and Yvonne Ing were, were all at, and like I think we would probably be more, more associated with no time to wait in this conference, and we'd kind of infiltrated that place. Um, where I remember Steve McConaughey saying that like tape generally wasn't really talk talked about that much at FIAF, is that cor correct in saying? Um, and I think that maybe No Time To Wait gave some of us a, a platform that we were able to go to other places as well. Um, and we were maybe legitimized in some way, maybe, in my opinion. Videotape still scares me a lot. I feel like there's so much I don't know about it. And uh, just from last year's presentation by um, Ben on, um, uh, time codes and um, this year again on closed captioning and various things I've discovered this last year about pixel aspect ratio discrepancies you know there's I think there's still a lot to do with videotape certainly but. well I think we should scare pe more pe people more because I don't think this is nearly or e even e even remotely done because there's still so many collections which are were not locked upon uh, locked upon including our videotape collection because we have not yet transferred everything and we are still uh, like lagging uh, apart uh, away. So I hope there is more of us and uh, that, yeah, we should, we should probably raise the voice more as in the previous presentation. I think it's also quite significant that the BFI are doing their H2022 project at the moment as well, 100,000 plus videotapes transfers. I think it's really exciting that they've picked Matroska and FFV1 as the format, and it's really great for regional archives in the UK to, to have that validation um, that the BFI are using this format. It makes it a lot easier to implement, um, which is, is great for people like me. <laughs> yeah, so even although I don't work in the analog world, I actually, like you said, for example, for uh, time code and closed caption, we actually have to find ways to store them in Matroska. For example, in four time codes, we are we're actively working on it, find a proper, so proper solution. We actually have three good solutions, uh, so we have to make decisions, but uh, so yeah, it still has, uh, an impact on our uh, work for the standardization of Matroska, there's still stuff to do before we are fully uh, covering all the issues that you can find in your work. And I think Kieran touched on it earlier um, about all the other cross-disciplinary um, activities that are going on at No Time to Wait. And um, I wonder, if based on a tweet that Dave a few days ago where he flipped products. I loved it, it was like a little angry bear tweet where he was just flipping the word products. Um, are we moving towards a productless community that relies on custom made software by archivists for archivists? Um, and how do we ensure this collaborative practice remains sustainable? There's definitely more of it going on. Um, it does seem to be like people making their own scripts and I think in terms of like making to like tools of the tools like QC tools and B record and all this, a lot of that does have Dave Rice at its core, you know, um, like very much so. Like he's the center of so much of these things. Um, like any any work that I've done, it's it's largely just been piggybacking on other command line tools and stuff like that. So it's, it's like nothing too significant. Uh, off the top of my head, I'm not. Sh I I think. We, as a field, we're still probably very much tied to products. Um, but I think that huge progress has been made in the last couple of years. Um, I don't think, um, like you can probably speak about this, it's just, you, I'm sure Mace has kind of been transitioning over to um, more of a, you know, moving away from products into custom workflows in the last year as well. We have, yes. Um, and it's been a big ask, really. You know, it is a big ask for people to do that, I think. 
um, tooling up and preparing um, your work environment to work with things that you don't have technical support for and that you are the technical support yourself or your community are. It's, it's, it's difficult to ask people to do that. Um, but you don't need to be a developer, I found, to install something, to try and use it and, and to share the process of your doing that. Um, just be daring enough to go onto a GitHub and use that and interact with the developers. Um, it's, it's really liberating and it's really um, validating of the, the steps you make and that you're actually giving back to the community. I think it's, it's a really worthwhile process. And it is, it's nice to, to know that you're actually moving into an environment that's controlled by your own people, you know? It's not, it's not gonna be um, just suddenly sh cut, down, cut off and shut down by, by a vendor at some point in the future. We, we can make things that actually work for us and are sustainable in the future, and that I think is really good. I think it's also good, sorry, when large institutions like the Irish Film Institute and British Film Institute lead the way, again, like I said earlier, it, it really gives confidence to the rest of the field, so. Well, as, uh, as for product-based uh, state, I, I don't think that uh, there is no product without open source, because if you look at the Marvel's things, which Maria Area and Jerome Martinez does, it's, uh, one of the models which seems to be s sustainable where you actually buy open source because you're not just buying the product, you're buying the work behind it and if not this, you can always uh, buy the support for your product and this is actually one of the main business models between uh, large uh, open source projects which are then funded by, by those uh, by, 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 the, by these monies, as, as in many Linux distributions, for example, or offerings. Yeah. Just on that, yeah, I mean, you're saying about the no time to wait effect and things like that. But, like, I actually think it's um, the idea yeah, of, of paying for free software. Um, I think that message was, like, <coughs> being made every year, every year um, by multiple presenters. And... I think each year it makes more and more sense to people. Um, if you see like all the names that are attached to Raw Cooked at the moment, like it's really, really encouraging because I don't think, um, I just think it was a very different environment four years ago, you know? Um, I guess th there's just been a lot of people, um, like I, I remember when, when I'd heard that the, um, the MediaTek, um, and I, I don't know, maybe Cooney as well, sponsored FFE1v3, or was it just MediaTek? Um, it was so inspiring, um, and I'd, I'd never really heard of it before, of anybody really doing that. And now it seems to be happening more and more, and it's, it's wonderful. Well, being on the other side of the open source products, I mean, I, like Carl would probably say the same, but it's really nice to see people that are not only use the stuff we do, but actually first enjoy it, understand it, want to push it forward, and are also being nice when they ask and are helpful. Uh, so, I mean, for us, it's uh, the perfect combination. Uh, you're winning, and we are also uh, growing uh, what we do. We are learning also. So, I mean, uh, for us, it's perfect. <laughs> yeah, I, I think using open source is not just monetary decision, but it's also a political decision as well. It's not just about uh, the budget, I think. Um, so, thinking more about the conference and its temporality, um, does the temporality of an annual conference focus generative activity, do you think? Um, ultimately encouraging new ideas or new project developments each year? I know day one of getting here, I was hearing people communicate what they were planning to do next year straight away, <laughs> very excitedly, and it's great to, to, to see the buzz um, in the build-up to the event on Twitter, for example, where people are talking about the things they're going to speak about, sending out the teasers. I love that part of, of the conference. Um, so what, how do you all feel about the temporality of the event? Is that one of the things that keeps it sustained, do you think, the fact that it's an annual thing that we... Actually, I remember the first No Time to Wait. I was kind of buzzing when leaving because it was so exciting to find people who understand what we're doing, who are actually happy about it. 
And basically, every time it's the same thing. L last year, I didn't come, but it was, I was atten uh, attending remotely, and it was the same. Yeah, I mean, you, the energy, the positive feeling you get from just coming, uh, listening to other people, learning new things, uh, getting new ideas of things to do, and then just after that, it, it pushes you to do more things. And so every year is good. Maybe every six months would even be better. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I think yeah, every year is great. Um, I hope no time to wait can continue on for a very long time. I, I think I'm, I, I, I usually just, if I'm speaking at an event or at no time to wait, I, I don't really feel a huge build up to it or anything like that, or I'm not gearing my work or research. It's just it's whatever I'm working on at the time. But what I find every time afterwards, I'd echo Steve. Um, I'm so invigorated and inspired every time. And even just like to pick out one example, what um, OSA archives, what they were showing yesterday was just so impressive. And there were so many things there I want to investigate or just re, you know, um, improve my own work. And like, th it's interesting that it, it's happening so late this year, because um, it's like, it's just, it's been a long year. It's been a, it's mm -hmm. been a hell of a year. and. I, like it's just, uh, I think you know we're all very passionate about our work and everything like that, and we all have massive workloads, so it's very easy to get very tired, uh, bordering on the burnout. And like m me at nine o'clock yesterday versus five o'clock yesterday, uh, I was a completely different person. I was so fired up at the end of it, um, just looking forward to the next year of everything that that could be done. I don't know if anyone else had a similar feeling, but um, it's it's great. I'm just. No, absolutely. That uh, I was thinking about it. That every year when I get back, the the excitement goes straight up, and then uh, pr proposing for a year, it goes like like this. And in the end, uh, we should make uh, no time to wait every three months. So the productivity <laughs> would go like the the graph would be, you know, so yeah, flatter. Yeah. So if we could um, just. We would like to open it to the whole room, really. We're going to talk a, a little bit about what our favorite moments are from the last four years, what notable achievements you think No Time to Wait has achieved, uh, any highlights that you have. Um, we'll start with the panel here. Um, for me, it's technical videos, technical outputs, time codes and captions, as I mentioned. Um, some of the videos that I was looking at before I came here, like the FFV1 stress testing, and um, Rito and Kieran's DPX to FFV1 um, videos were always a massive bonus for me to be able to just look at that resource and use it for my own practice was just amazing. It was, it was a real eye opener. Um, so that's been one of my highlights today. For me, it was actually uh, staying at Jerome's place in Berlin. <laughs> it, it doesn't seem like it's related to No Time To Wait, but for me it's completely related because I stayed with his family. Uh, it was like being home and in a family there. Uh, and it feels like the whole conference was just like a group family gathering and it seems it's always like that. So for me it just, uh, it set the tone for me exactly what to expect and it, it's, I mean, that's what I expect from No Time To Wait and never disappoints. So thank you, Jérôme. <laughs> yeah, I guess like I talked about all the, you know, inspiring technical knowledge and uh, that you can accrue here and all that, but I think all of my favorite moments are just things like just people. Um, Getting, like uh, unexpected things like getting to actually meet Carl Lugan Hoyos from FFmpeg, who was like, you know, he was like ridiculously nice to me. Um, he n knew I was Irish, so he brought a, a hat that was given to him in, can I say where you got it from? Uh, from like NATO, special forces or wherever he used to work. <laughs> Um, and they, he served with loads of Irish soldiers, and they said, like, whenever you meet somebody from Ireland, make sure you wear this hat, and he actually brought it to No Time To Wait. And it was, like, incredibly sweet. Um, and I remember when we were meeting up the night before No Time To Wait 2, I remember Alessandro Luciano, like, was gonna moderate a panel 
with Carl, and at the time that when you would Google his name, the first thing that came up was a vote to ban Carl Ugenhoyos from FFmpeg. So everyone was like terrified about like wh wh what we were going to uh, encounter, and he was like so sweet. But actually, my favorite moment, I think, was, it was a moment I was, I was quite moved by in the first No Time to Wait, when there, that was a three-day conference, and the second day, there, uh, some of us went to the, I think, the Zoos Institute, and we watched the IETF um, meeting, I guess. And I think it was maybe Dave Jerome and Steve went. And it was so lovely um, when Steve got up to speak and um, he had just talked about and um, made a specific uh, note of the concerns of audiovisual archivists, that there are certain features you know, that we will have to work on. And it just felt like even just after a day of the conference that um, uh, I feel like we had kind of pulled Steve into our world and I, I, I was just very moved by it, weirdly enough. I, I, I can't, and I explained it to Steve afterwards and I just thought it was very nice. I don't have an exact moment, but uh, for sure it has been the standardization process of all of either FFE1, FLAC, and EBML in the ITF, because if these things, which I'm not exactly right if it originated uh, in this community, I think, um, I might be wrong, but if uh, this all goes forward, it will out outlive us all. So I think because we're still waiting to celebrate that it, or I'm, I'm waiting for it to become an actual RFC and every year I'm go get going back and waiting, hey, it's gonna be the, oh, next Christmas maybe. So uh, let's wait for another new time to wait if uh, we actually will got the numbers. Yeah, I think the legacy of the videos actually is really important. Um, the um, the information that I've gleaned from that has been fascinating, fabulous, and and just the warmth. Yeah, like you say, the the kind of sense of belonging when you when you join No Time to Wait in the community and the accessibility you get to great people like these is just wonderful for me. Um, does anybody in the audience like to feed Anyone? into I can this? Bring you the, the microphone, Ashley. I think I'd also love to have a, a no time to wait every three months or something, but also as an organizer, it's quite exhausting. And I'm wondering um, if, if all of you have any ideas of how people can work together and collaborate, um, the best vehicle to do that or to stay in touch throughout the year. Sorry, I didn't mean, of course, I uh, did not want to uh, under, uh, overestimate your work. That I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm so amazed, but by what the whole organizing committee can get done. And I, I, I know that it couldn't be done every three months, of course, yeah, so, but, yeah. I think it's still a lovely idea, though. Um, thank you for the prompt, Ashley. She reminded me to mention that um, a month or two ago, um, after last year's No Time to Wait, I was very eager to continue the conversation and to continue kind of access and communications between this community. And um, a few months ago, Catherine Francis Nagels, who's a wonderful, helper on May scripts, approached myself, Kieran, Ashley, and asked if we would like to create a Zulip, which is like um, a kind of an open source version of Slack, I think, um, which Kieran named AV Hackers, I'm blaming him. <laughs> um, and it's called AV Hackers, and it's accessible um, by invitation, or we can um, or you can access it through my GitHub um, under AV Hackers. And it's just a space, we haven't, we haven't actually defined what it's for really, but it's, it's kind of for people to just come together and to chat. Um, I think it's really useful for people in the beginner intermediate stage possibly to kind of come and ask questions and have a community of really talented people that have already populated it for us. Thank you very much, many are in the room. Um, so yeah, I think that's one of the ways, certainly. I think we did like a, a soft launch, I would call it. <laughs> We're like, should we set things up? And we're like, no, let's just start inviting people. <laughs> Other questions or responses or any other responses to Ashley's proposal about how we might keep in touch better? I'm coming. We have a couple actually, so uh, get ready. So my ask, ask how might the hashtag and TTY community, oh, not time to wait, sorry, 
engage others rather than all the weight of the work and advocacy being on the archivist slash developers. Sorry, could, could you repeat that? How might the No Time to Wait community engage others rather than all the weight of the work and advocacy being on the archivists and developers? I don't have an answer. So. <laughs> I don't think I have an answer either. I don't think, I'm, I'm really sorry, Samaya. <laughs> I, my, my, I'm not braining right. It's, it's the, um, I'm, I'm so sorry. I actually. We should make leaflets like memory of. I feel like I can kind of give an answer. I think that um, so much of it's here are inspired by Dave Rice, and Dave Rice is essentially like creating small versions of himself. He has been such a mentor to so many people. So if all of us strive to do that just as much, even like a quarter of the amount that Dave does, I think we'll be on our way to um, just sharing the work around. Um, I, I'll comment quickly as I take the microphone over to Stephen. Um, to, to get here took a lot of convincing. And um, a lot of that came from a lot of some support from Dave and Joanna, who um, wrote me a lot of encouraging emails, but also gave me a lot of um, helpful language to use in convincing um, my institution to send me here. So if anybody has advice about how they um, uh, advocated for themselves or how they, um, how they felt like they, uh, this conference has legitimized them within their institution and they could share that in a way that might help other people uh, make a case for themselves to be here. That could be helpful. And one of the many questions that Erwin asked, sorry, Erwin, we only asked one. Consensus is great, and No Time to Wait is here, and much work in EMEA and other AV organizations are gaining awareness. How do we prevent in-crowding, keep reaching out both to AV and outside? I think it helps as well just that um, I think it's becoming much more normalized now that um, archivists are picking up um, more IT skills, command line skills, and engaging with open source. I think just naturally we seem to be um, not just accepting failure when something goes wrong. I think, I think in general we're engaging with um, other communities a lot more. Um, and I think that's quite an infectious thing that can come out of this conference. Is like, and it does help when you have some of the developers in this room. I'm not sure if that answers the question. I think um, blogging might help. That's, that's the one thing I've, I've fallen on. And I've really enjoyed blogging. And it, the views have been international in quite high numbers. And that surprised me, in truth. Um, how you make them come into this room and engage, though, I, I'm not sure. I guess by, by increased amounts of blogging, maybe, and then just sort of enthusiasm for the event, hopefully. Hey, uh, I just would like to comment from, I think it has an amazing impact on individuals and their feeling about work and their you know, ability to cope with the grimmest year and record and all that stuff. But I just thought I'd mention the impact it can have on an organization. Um, and for me, that's really hard to overstate that the, the series has had an incredibly transformative impact on the BFI's approach to, our, to the BFI National Archives approach to our work. It's really easy to, to think back and, and f like have a narrative of how we change from the archive we were to the archive we, we are now. But these events made that happen, really, because it helped to build my confidence that I was in a safe space to, to change and experiment and do things that the broadcasters don't and do new things with the DPXs that industry does and all that stuff. And because I felt confident, I could advocate to my organization and then having no time to wait in the BFI, and I could bring like 20 people. So the, the impact was really huge, and it's actually transformed one of the biggest national archives in the world, this event. Um, and it's, you know, the organizers should take credit. If they can do that for five archives a, a year for the next 20 years, it's like a global transformation. So it really is amazing. And so yeah, thank you so much to everyone. You. Um, I think it's not only the conference. I'm, uh, with, um, I'm attending No Time to Wait since its second edition in uh, Vienna. 
But I think the, the live stream and also that we, you are recording or we are recording the uh, thing. And then when we are talking in a professional circle within the Open Society Archives about issues, I can say, yeah, there was a, a, a presentation about this issue and there is an easy way just to send the link so that my colleagues can, so I can always refer to this thing. So I think that this is this transparency, this sharing, uh, this idea of, um, of not being secretive and that there are no, no proprietary ideas, I think it's really an added thing. So thank you very much for recording this and uh, sharing always what, uh, all the presentations. Uh, speaking of the live stream, I think we have more questions and then I'm gonna come back to the audience. Um, no, just to say that we are getting a lot of um, engaging and positive feedback also from the people on the live stream. So I guess um, when there are many questions, so I guess if people have specific questions, we could just like, connect over Twitter, but generally it's saying that there's like great closing panel and um, really sharing all of your points and ideas and they feel also very welcomed, I'm assuming, from how they're interacting with us through the screen. So yeah, I think that's pretty, that's a, uh, Sign of success. Yep. Maybe go to this person first because they have their hand. Uh, Loda again, I have something to say what Kieran said. It's more like I come from the IT background and media artist background. So I would say how to uh, broaden the spectrum of people that come here, bring your IT, because that's what Bert did with me two years ago. He brought me to uh, Vienna. And now um, this uh, conference has helped me to understand my colleagues better, understand my colleagues who are archivists better, understand what they need, and also get all, a lot of inspiration to help them better in the future and, and uh, get new projects done. I, I think that's a fantastic idea. There, there are some of us, though, who don't have any IT support. Like, we, we have a company that outsourced that they'll fix our printers and stuff like that but everything else we have to do ourselves, unfortunately. But if anyone does have that, that's, that's a wonderful thing. I think a lot of, uh, I think there is a great skill in um, archivists learning to speak the, uh, the language and terminology, I guess, of IT and having that, um, met that crosswalk. Um, yeah, great idea. Uh, I just wanted to follow up on Lex's comment earlier uh, about me and Joanna kind of communicating with her and um, the person who's joined us. Um, I think there are a number of you here who I've had to write uh, invitation emails for sometimes because often like we work in an environment where our organization or bosses or employers don't need some convincing to support our attendance in a conference like this to, you know, to, to engage in that kind of professional development, especially in a new conference that is a bit unknown. Um, and often people need like, you know, a, a voice or some kind of proof that the representation is an encouraging force here. And I just wanted to say like, it, you know, so part of like what I've done to help support some people in coming here is, is just like writing an email to be like, you know, uh, Karen, like you're an excellent subject matter expert. Like your, the work you're doing really reflects on our theme this year. Um, you know, maybe you've seen this from the emails I've sent to any of you, but uh, I just want to say like, we can be that voice for ourselves to encourage and support ourselves. Like to write an email fancy enough that, you know, we can forward it to our boss and get here. <laughs> Thank you for your emails. Anyone else? I don't know what time it is. Uh, a few minutes? Yeah. Um, in your opinion, uh, also in the public, what uh, could we do it to in order to improve even more on the time to wait? Five, six, seven, I don't know. What is missing for, from your point of view? Uh, what are the, uh, the problems with no time to wait? I don't know, I think it's getting better and better every year. Um, I don't know, uh, maybe enforce the, or maybe point out the code of conduct more. I think that was something that was maybe said at the end of the last one that it wasn't maybe um, talked about enough. Um, but in general, I think like this is an incredibly w like well-run, organized event. Like just 
it's with the live streaming and like the, the introduction of the stage coordinators in No Time to Wait 2. Like it, it, it runs so well and it's really, really lovely. Um, I, I wasn't actually at the, the, the work day or the hack day, so maybe um, I, I, I'm not sure if, if, the, if that worked or if, if that was a good thing or not. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd like to add that I really liked Julia's presentation this year and I thought that was really helpful for somebody who's beginning or, or is starting to work with video archiving material. Um, I guess I'd like to see more things like that maybe, where there's more perhaps group analysis of things. I think it's a really good learning opportunity, so that would be something I would... Uh, yeah, uh, I think the hack day was a wonderful idea. I, very, I liked it pretty much. Uh, but I would maybe propose for a next time to have a little bit more rigid structure because as we agreed that most of us are a little bit socially awkward, the structure is somehow needed sometimes, but it was, it was fine, but I think there could be um, maybe more groups, more topics because we, have, uh, we had a lot of topics and in the end we ended up only with a fixed set of uh, larger groups we, where we discuss something, but other than that, that was wonderful without an issue. I loved it, thanks. Um, well, same for me, uh, the work day was very useful. Uh, I learned a lot as well. And uh, also today and yesterday, so many people have lots of problem in, with playback or with their files or they don't know what's going on. I have so many comments. Uh, so I think, I don't know if it's too short or we don't have time to develop or maybe there should be a, a deep before or after where we can actually discuss the problems and solve them where we can help. So if this is something that the community wants, uh, we could try to do a, like bring your file uh, session next year. Um, I'm happy and I'm sure Steve is as well uh, to look at broken or well or non-broken files that don't work and uh, perhaps we can do something about them. That sounds really great. Mm -hmm. Actually there was this one other thing as well like uh, um, you know we talked about our experience of like being at the first one and then coming back and stuff like that like I'd really encourage if there was anyone here who's maybe just been here for the first time or uh, maybe it's her second time or maybe to think about speaking even at a lightning talk next year. Um, I mean, the lightning talks can even be just four or five minutes, just um, or if you've never asked a question or, you know, if you've never really even talked to people that much here, you know, um, to, to get involved in that way. Like, what I always find is, like, if you end up ever, like, solving something and you, you haven't been able to Google it or find it on an EAL or Twitter or something, um, shouldn't just keep that knowledge to yourself. Um, you share it in some way, whether it's in a tweet or a blog post or a lightning talk at no time to wait. Like I think a lot of times we don't actually give ourselves credit for some of the innovative problem solving that we do. I think this is a great space to be able to just share. And um, it gets easier every time once you've, sp once you've spoken up here for the first time, it gets easier. Yeah, and, and I would say any level as well, you know, you don't feel like you have to be the ultimate te technician to, to come up and do this. I do not feel that way at all. And um, I'm very privileged to be here sat with these people. But um, yeah, I do feel like an imposter. But yeah, any level, get involved. And definitely being involved and sitting on the stage or standing on the stage, um, it brings people to you in a way that just general participation doesn't do. And that, I think, is incredibly valuable. I think, are we on time? Any other comments from? No, oh, one more. I think it's a good idea to have uh, particular examples discussed, but if possible, you know, in the whole group, I especially like the questionable file presentation where actually there was uh, something presented and the feedback going on for everybody. So uh, I think that format could be a good thing. And generally, I think it's it's always a problem in, in uh, in conferences that there is, on one hand, you have a lot of presentations and you want to see them. On, on the other hand, you want to talk to individuals or do networking or whatever. So um, this year I've, I found it quite good, but uh, maybe uh, on the side of organizers, don't forget the time where people 
have the time to, like the breaks where you have the time to talk to each other. Uh, it just comes to my mind as you say this, that maybe there we could make a call for, if I see on the participants list somebody with whom I would like to talk to, that's, uh, there could be a platform on which I could reach out or ask the organizing committee to to help us come together because all I don't attach faces to names or so somehow to facilitate this if it's possible. Okay, Come on. Are you done? Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm gonna hand Thank it over to Dave. Hi, so there's just a couple of things left. Uh, firstly, I'm gonna invite up Shusha, just to, our host, just to thank you. Uh, we'll have some information about No Time to Wait next year. Uh, we'll have, a, we'll, we, at the end of that, we'll come up to the front for a goodbye photo, like all of us will be here. Uh, and then we will invite you over to a reception for the birthday of Matroska. We have cake and wine. Uh, but first, Shusha, would you join? I, I would like to thank you, um, uh, the organizing committee, so that this year uh, the Open Society Archives was selected as the venue for No Time to Make. It's much more to the Open Society Archives just giving the space to you. I think the um, No Time to Wait is um, very much, or the spirit is so much part of our identity, not just you brought as a new workflow or with the help of No Time to Wait. We, totally reformized our workflows, but it's really what was just said at this um, um, round table, square table, um, was um, what um, we identify with. So I very much hope that if we, uh, through this conference, we will be able to better reach out to people that we think we can learn from or we can learn from each other. So, thank you for coming. It was a privilege to having you here this year. Hi, yes. Um, so, first thing first. Let's see what's happening. Is this the moment? Okay, just real quick. Voila. Um, welcome on stage, Johan Oman. Uh, head of Research at Sound and Vision, our next host for No Time to Wait 5 2020. Um, okay, so this is the announcement. Um, it's going to be super difficult. Most, I think it's impossible to, you know, organize a conference better than this, this year's event, but we will make a brave attempt. So maybe, you, you know, we can... Uh, learn from our local host how to run an event as successfully as this one. Um, so next year's event uh, is going to be held in the Netherlands at Sound and Vision. Um, these are the dates. Uh, it will happen um, in September, so uh, it's only 292 days away. Uh, so we have to work super hard and uh, you know uh, to present new works to, um, to to the community in just a couple of months, if you think about it. Um, so, um, Sound and Vision, it is um, the audiovisual archive and media museum of the Netherlands. We are located in Hilversum, and this is where uh, quite a few media uh, industry uh, is uh, concentrated, public broadcasters, commercial broadcasters, uh, uh, production uh, uh, companies, etc. Uh, it's half an hour by train from Amsterdam, direct train, 45 minutes, also direct train from Hil uh, Schiphol Airport. And if you would like to see Vermeer's uh, uh, painting, um, then you can go to The Hague, uh, take a train, uh, 90 minutes. Um, so it's very uh, easy, easily to reach. Um, some pictures of what Sound of Vision looks like from the inside. Uh, the main picture, you see a couple of familiar faces. This was uh, taken a couple of weeks ago where, when we hosted the YASA and JTS conferences back to back, which we are still recovering from. Um, well, it was, it was awesome. Um, so this, uh, 
some words about Sound and Vision and using open source uh, technology. We've been uh, one of the uh, partners in Performa. Performa uh, played quite a big role in uh, standardization of FFV1, as you know. Also, every year we host the uh, Winter School for Audiovisual Archiving, and um, we, we make a brave effort to uh, share the, the knowledge and the presentations um, and on the web. Uh, many of those presentations also touch uh, upon open um, source technology. Uh, I think similar to, um, to, to BFI, we hope that um, hosting No Time to Wait will have an, a positive effect on Sound and Vision because I have to admit that um, we use proprietary technology to, um, for many of our um, um, uh, workflows. So we also hope that by inviting the community, we can also make a difference there. So. Uh, two slides more. Uh, these are your local organizers, um, Erwin Verbruggen, uh, Rasa Bocite, myself. Um, and uh, with this, I will hope to see you next year in the Netherlands. Thank you very much. Yay, thank you so much. Um, also, if you have any interest in the future of hosting, please come and see us about it. Like, yeah, 2021, 22. All right, now, um, if we can all, in somewhat orderly fashion, try to move up front for the group picture. I'm gonna take the Netherlands off the screen. Yeah, I'll come back to the logo. Okay, there. great, yeah. All right, group photo, everybody. Thank you so much. Get up here. <coughs> yeah, I wish we had the live stream on. <laughs> oh, we could put the live stream up. Don't cut the live stream. No, I mean, I could put the live stream on the, on the screen. So the remote yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you, no, no, not yet. No, 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 no. 